Yeah, have I, uh, I've got asked to start video. I've just done that. There start we go. Video. <laughs> <laughs> Technology no, works. Works. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. Yeah, it's it's good to finally see you sort of face to face, as it were. Yeah, yeah. A few people have said that. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I'm I'm a I'm a podcast virgin, so I'm delighted to be here. And I'm delighted to take your guidance when it starts at half six and just go with the flow. Yeah, no problem. We can start straight away if you want. It's, it's no problem. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I've got I've got extra lights going on because I picked up your point about that. Um, yep. Everybody's gone home, so it's quiet in the factory. Um, so we, we should really be good to go. Fantastic. Audio's good. Sounds great to me. Yeah. Can you I hear can my hear fan them. in the background? No, I can't. I'm just going to turn you up a bit here because old and deaf and smell of cabbage. So that's good. So yes, Excellent. it's right. nice to make your acquaintance. I knew, mate. I knew. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it. No, no, no. It's, it's it is really, really, really is my pleasure. I'm I'm looking forward to uh, explaining myself as best I can, and uh, hopefully, I think a few people might might find it of, of interest. But we shall see. Right. In that case, folks who are listening and watching, welcome back to Brew Time. Sorry there's been a little bit of a break. I've been away. It's hectic over the summer months with all my tours and stuff, so I'll try and keep yeah. the podcast as regular as I can. But this week, we've got Mark Hooten here from Cymark, Cymark Bike Parts. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing absolutely fine, and I think it's about time to have a glass of wine. Excellent. Good work. Good work. I have Prop, a, say. a beer primed and ready. Prepared. Oh, oh yes, good health. There yeah. we go. What's that vintage you've got there? Which one's that? It's it's a very nice Argentinian Malbec. Oh. I prefer the more robust wines. Uh, in fact, some may say I prefer anything that's red. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I do enjoy it, and it's it'll probably be my ruin. You know. Cheers, Cheers fella. Health. All Slide. the best. Right then, so. Mark, who are you and what's Say Mark all about? Right, okay. I'll kind of start at the beginning because that's normally the best place to start and it means that I won't trip myself up because I'm old and I smell of cabbage. Um, but um, my working life started when I was 16 and my father said, have you got a job? I went, no. So he said, right, you're going in the army. So I went into the armed forces to serve the Queen and... Um, that was my first, my first ever lesson in life because, unbeknown to me, the regiment I joined at the very young age of 17 was 16th Air Defence Royal Artillery. Now, the thing there, Brucey, is that these guys, they recruited and still do, I think, from the Strathclyde area. Okay. And I got to know this, this this wonderful breed of people, which we knew as the Sweaty Socks. <laughs> and they were wonderful. I learned a complete new language. I learned how to headbutt properly. And I <laughs> learned how to drink whiskey. But there was a downside to this. There was a downside. The downside was, God bless them all, if England was ever playing Scotland in a football match, hey, you know <laughs> what I'm going to say? If, 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 if England won... Then all the wonderful sweaty socks would go around the barracks and beat the bejesus out of us because we beat them at football. Yeah. Now the thing is, this is true. This, if Scotland won, they still came around the barracks and beat the bejesus out of us. <laughs> yeah. Be be <laughs> because they won at football. Uh, uh, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm trying to make it humorous and entertaining. Um, some of the best people I ever met during my military career uh and um uh i've still got contacts to this day uh from my uh from my army days anyway moving on about uh eight years later we had the falklands um which which i was in uh and thankfully i hid at the bottom of the trench uh so i didn't see any action and that was good and uh, shortly thereafter, the, the Navy decided that they wanted our air defence assets, something called rapier. Mm. Um, now, rather than take a bunch of Royal Marine commandos and train them to operate rapier, they decided to take some rapier guys, um, 
pick from three regiments and turn them into commandos, in effect. I was stood at the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and me and a few of the guys were, were what's known at the time, and it's disbanded now as G Troop. And G Troop was the forerunner of 20 Commando Battery. 20 Commando Battery was part of 2-9 Commando based in Plymouth. And we used to support 4-2 Commando in oh. Norway. So I spent four years in Norway, which was Jeez. great, but it was bloody cold. Uh, and one of the reasons I left was that um, the only way I could get out and do the rock climbing was if I managed to uh, sedate myself the night before because I'm scared of heights. No I'm scared way. Of heights. Really? Yeah, 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 I'm actually. Um, uh, well, I'm scared of heights and the wife. Uh, more so <laughs> of the wife, I think, and... Uh, I'll come on to that and the issue I've got with motorbikes later on. So um, I did I did four years, uh, uh, 12 years in total, four years in Norway, decided to get out. Uh, and that's when, that's when Simark kind of started. So that's the, that's the backstory to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so far? Uh, absolutely. I've got questions already, but I'll, I'll let oh, you, I'll okay. let you in the floor. Well, I'll let you carry on the floor. Uh, well, I, I could be I could be here for weeks. Only joking. Quite all right. So if you've got any questions, jump in now before we all forget about them. But okay, then. Anyway, so in that um, case, in that case, yes. scared of heights, what was the pull to rock climbing? What was the what? Sorry? If you're scared of heights, what was the pull to rock climb? How come you wanted um, to rock climb? Yeah, well, no, I didn't want to rock climb. The sergeant major wanted me to rock climb. <laughs> right, okay. Um, and um, some of the um, um, some of the jocks also moved into twenty commando battery um, uh, with me, so uh, I didn't know what was more frightening: a jock who had just seen his team lose to England, or a sergeant major. Who wanted me to go up a, a, a cliff face, and despite all the whimpering and crying I could possibly manage, it didn't cut any any ice whatsoever. I still had to go up that uh, uh, that, that that mountain, and it was for me. If you've if you've ever had any uh, uh, fears, um, it was for me quite quite terrifying. And I used to cling to the rock face. I used to try and suck myself into the rock, rock face yeah. and bite pieces of the cliff to make sure that I wouldn't fall off. And yeah, it was, it was, it was quite, it's quite terrifying, but I had to do it because I was told to do it. And if I didn't do it, then uh, there was probably a good old Glaswegian kicking coming my way. Wow. <laughs> Did you get over the fear then eventually? Um, no, I just tried to overcome it, really. Um, I, I'd still go up on rickety scaffolding at the top of my house and do some uh, exterior decorating, even though I was scared of high. Mm -hmm. um, I'd still I'd still do it. And I was I'm still am terrified to this day. But wow. um, yeah, you just you just kind of get on with it, I suppose. Go on, yeah, uh, yeah, get I, it done. I, I, I do it less and less now. I do it less and less. So maybe I'm becoming wiser. Yeah. Um, and maybe I'm just thinking, if I don't have to do it, why should I? You so, don't yeah, hang around the... with the Scottish circles anymore, then. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do. <laughs> Actually, a good friend came in today um, who uh, I was the best man at his wedding. He, what what bugs me about him, uh, he's from Glasgow, by the way, what bugs me about him is a very dear friend of mine, but he's the same weight he was oh. when we served. In I, I know, it makes you sick. The yeah. guy's Oops, a racing sorry. snake. He's got a pulse that indicates that he's nearly dead, and uh, he's he's just he's just amazing. And the rest of us get hairy, we get bigger, <laughs> we smell more of wee and cabbage. But no, not him. Does 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 me in? Does Makes me you in. sick, does it? I've got a mate of mine. He, he, he's an ex. He's an ex bootneck, ex marine, and yeah. uh, I swear, like he he looks like he's in his late twenties, early thirties, and he's the same age as me. And he's just yeah. Like, Incredible. Still got, still got like six pack, amazing physique. I mean, he yeah. does train. He does train, and he's got a lot of yeah. self discipline. So yeah, that helps. But I mean, he still looks young. Still looks right. Makes you sick. Sorry to interrupt, folks, but just a quick shout out for this week's sponsors, who are, as always, 
Ultimate Add-ons. Ultimate Add-ons have been back in the podcast for the last few years, and I've been using their products since probably around about 2017, 2018. They specialize in phone holders, so both the mounts that attach to your bike and the protective cases that your phone goes in. Now, these cases are shockproof, they're dustproof. They're the perfect things to put your phone in whilst you're on the bike. And even if you do have a mishap, your phone is nicely protected inside that case. You can still use the phone, you can still use the touchscreen, you can even still use the cameras. They do a wide selection of mounts. I use the ratchet strap which is actually in their cycle section but you can pick any one you like for your particular bike or a generic one it's up to you Ultimate add-ons are also doing a number of other accessories, things like action camera mounts. They're also now doing heated grips. They do things like a balaclava, uh, USB, USB-C, power adapters, lots of different things. Head to their website, check out the products, and if you use the code TEAPOT1 with the number 10, TEAPOT110, then you will get 10% off. A massive thanks to Ultimate add-ons for all your support. And a massive shout out to all of you over in the clan, over on Patreons, patreon.com forward slash teapot1. I literally could not do this full time without your support, folks. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for going that extra mile with your support. You're also the backbone of the Brew Time podcast with all your questions. So keep them coming and we'll go from strength to strength. So, Simark, you, you said um, Simark sort uh, of arrived yeah, yeah, yeah. as you right. came out of the, the okay. forces. Thanks for putting me back on track. Now, um, when you leave the military, you you get offered a a, a pre-release course. Yeah, everybody does driving, carpentry, plumbing stuff like that. Uh, I decided to do Asian cooking. The reason for that is that I've never been taught how to cook, and in the army, of course, they feed you, they clothe you, yeah. they mother you, they beat you up, they do everything you might possibly need. And uh, I thought, right, I need a, to, to learn a skill. So I went off and did uh, did Asian cooking. Um, they pointed out to me that although that was quite noble, maybe I needed a more practical <laughs> skill. Yeah, for Civvy Street. Um, so I, I went and did uh, a, a business course. So, which basically taught me how to count. Didn't do anything more than that. Remember, I was in the artillery. So um, I applied for a job as a pl- pl- as a prison warden, mm-hmm. uh, I actually got it uh, in Hull Prison, but at the last moment I had a, um, uh, a misgivings and I decided not to go down that route. Instead, I decided to um, go into business with, with a nurse while civilian mate of mine. Um, mm-hmm. And now that's where the sign mark comes from. His name was Simon. My name's Mark. We took the oh, sign right. and the mark. And yeah, and we put it together. And if you ever look at the the because there's two parts to sign mark, there's the bike parts thing, which I'm very passionate about, which you know. Uh, and there's also the industrial side. We we supply into the railway industry. Um and the the side mark is designed as such that when you look at it at the side, it's shaped like a, a milling cutter, uh, which you use to 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 mill metals and things like that. So right. Quite a bit of time went into coming up with this this Cymark thing and then spanked me till I'm rosy red after about a year. The the partnership just just fell to bits because oh. um he couldn't get up in the mornings uh and I could, so you could see that it was going to unravel. Um the the entertaining thing there was that and I'll never forget this. I went to the bank and I said, look. I've split with uh, Simon. Um, he can't get out of bed. I'm trying to get out of bed. Uh, and they said, and I'll never forget this, uh, and I'm paraphrasing now, they said, because we think you haven't got a hope in hell, we're going to withdraw all the facilities, which is bank speak for screwing you over. Yeah. So they, they withdrew all my banking facilities, um, uh, and I had nothing. My erstwhile partner went off and got a job somewhere, and I had to start – even lower than the beginning. And I've got a couple of props to show you. I had to start. I don't know if you can make this out. I'll try not to get a... Now, that's a, a mushroom growing shed. Can you make that yeah. out? Yeah, I can see, yeah. yeah. Um, I had nothing. I went to a local farmer, and I said, look, can I rent your mushroom growing shed? And he said, yeah. And at the time, all I had was a very old 15-ton press, which was old older than me and indeed rustier than me um and some tea and coffee so i moved into 
said mushroom growing shed. And of a night time, the machine used to go orange with rust because it was so damp in there. It was yeah. meant to be to grow mushrooms. mushrooms. Yep. And the rats used to eat my tea and coffee. So, yeah, yeah, they used to eat my tea and coffee. So um, that that was a, a very entertaining start or restart of my illustrious business career. Now, um, I think I did about a year, maybe a year and a half there. And um, I was I was single. I was just living on a fridge full of lager and curry. Uh, There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, no, the curry get you I was taught life. how to exactly curry. I was taught how to cook, and the lager I could get from the shop. So I was quite happy. So over a period of time, I amassed a huge amount of money by my standards, and I didn't know what to spend it on. I'd had my fill of hookers and beer, so there wasn't much really I could I could spend it on. So I decided to have a a, a factory built. I bought some land, um, had a building put on it, which I'm in now. I'm still in it now, and uh, I started to slowly build up what we know as Cymark, the industrial side of life, and um, things were going really really well. <laughs> until until Rover decided to go bust. Now, up to up to Rover, I'd started to employ people and um, found that the, the wonderment of uh, of that. Uh, and I, I filled the the, the factory with um, old style old style power presses. Remember, I started off with a little fifteen ton that went rusty overnight. Uh, my biggest press now was a hundred and fifty ton. And I used to use that to press out parts for over cars. And there was, whoa, quite a few of us hanging from the roof, uh, hanging from the girders. So life was good. Rover went pop. And uh, the government at the time said, if you've if you've got a chance of surviving, we'll we'll fund you. We'll we'll help you survive. Um, so I had accountants crawling out of every orifice to make sure that my business had some sort of chance of surviving and thankfully it did and that allowed me to invest in this this laser technology which i used to to make the bike parts yeah i bought my first laser um and uh, it's not unsubstantial at all as once you've got it installed there uh, for an industrial laser, there's not much change out of half a million pounds. So wow, it's, it's yeah, no, yeah, 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 serious stuff. Uh, but thankfully, <laughs> wine got me through. All that eases the decision. <laughs> oh yeah, honestly, it's got me. People who say that <laughs> it's it's a it's a bane on our lives just just aren't drinking the right vintage in my mind. <laughs> but anyway, um, I bought <clears throat> bought the first laser um and that really it technology is great but it meant that i didn't need all these power presses um and i didn't need all these guys to run the power presses so uh over a period of time where we have natural wastage the guys moved on and i didn't replace them because the laser could make anything you could possibly desire in in a flash compared to old school of where you've got to make a press tool and you've got to put it in the press and you've got yeah. to make the stuff. So um, that started me on the, on the uh, uh, laser road and the, um, the, the Cymark industrial business continued from, from that point on and, and just kind of grew and grew and grew. Um, and we ended up with uh, the main factory where I'm, that's where I am now, uh, and uh, two branches on the other side of town. Now, one branch, I'd, um, I'd, I'd actually gone and got another laser uh, primarily to, to make bike parts with. And I hope he's not listening, but uh, if the bank manager ever found out that I scrounged nearly half a million pounds to get a laser just to make bike parts, he would beat me like the jocks used to. Yeah, <laughs> it really, really, really would. Because the figures, the figures, Brucey, the figures do not stack up. Yeah. No way does what I do with the bike parts stack up to make something like a half a billion pound laser profiler viable. But I told him it was for the core business, you see. Mm -hmm. Hey. <laughs> Cunning. So, got this laser. 
and uh, I started to, to mess about. And I've been a biker, actually, for more than 30 years. I'd say probably nearly nearly 50 years now. And I started on bikes when I was very early teenager. So uh, a mate of mine, in fact, it was the jock um, who, uh, who was here today. He had something called a V-Strom, a Suzuki V-Strom. Yeah. They're amazing bikes. They're, they're, they're built to a budget, even worse than the BMWs. And uh, the really characteristic thing about the V-Stroms is that all the fasteners are made of cheese. They are awful bikes to work on. Um, and he bought it because he's 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 thrifty and I love him to bits. And um, he said, look, Mark, there's a, there's a problem with the bike. You're an engineer. Um, drunk engineer most of the time. You're an engineer. Can you sort it? So I creative, have a creative bike. engineer, Mark. Creative, creative, creative. Yeah, I like that word. I, I'll use that more often. Thank you. So I had a look at the bike, and I found out that the there was an offset between the front and rear sprocket of one point four seven millimeters. So I designed a spacer to correct this, so that the rear sprocket sprocket was perfectly in line with the front one. Mm -hmm. and the clunky gearbox disappeared overnight. Wow. It, it, yeah, it, it went. Now, I've tried to think this through because my mate said, how on earth can somebody like you, Mark, because I know you, come up with something like this? News to me. You know, I've got no idea. What goes on up here sometimes really scares everybody. So um, I said, well, I, I, all I've done is correct this this offset, and it seems to have worked. So I thought, hang on, I might be onto something here. So I didn't patent it or anything like that. Um, I put it up for sale, I think initially on, on Fleabay or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I sold loads of them. This was a fault, not just on my mate's bike. It's a fault, um, if you can call it a fault, on all Suzuki DL1000s of mm -hmm. that time. Yeah. So I was selling these, these spaces. In fact, they're still on the site now. You can still buy them to this day. And I thought... Hmm. I really enjoyed doing that. I even surprised myself and my mate Ricky that I managed to figure this one out. It was around about the time that I got my first BMW, uh, a 2005 GS, and I bought it from a guy uh, up in Aberdeen, and uh, I rode it back down, and I started to make parts for for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is really where it all started to happen. Now, what I did was throw uh, any 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 idea, any common sense about finances, profit and loss out the window because, A, it was my bike, so I wasn't bothered about the cost. Yeah, I just wanted the best. I just wanted the best. And, and B, my day job, was driving me nuts because I had to skin, I had to skin a fart to save a penny in my day job All to right. make sure that I stay competitive. So to be able to take a clean sheet and think, right, okay, I'm not bothered about how much it costs. I'm going to spend whatever it takes to make the best part I possibly can with my three brain cells for my bike so that I'm happy with it. And, and once again, spank me till I'm rosy red. Amazingly, it was a bit of a, a USP. People started to gravitate towards it, and people started to buy my parts. Uh -huh. They could also ring me up any time of the day as long as I wasn't, A, asleep, or B, drunk. <laughs> and I would talk to them because I was impassioned about what I do and how I make it and how I love all my little babies, and they, they would react very well to it. And, of course, they didn't have to learn Mandarin to yep. be able to speak to the guy who designed and made it. And it started to, to get a, a life of itself. Um, the V-Strom guys made me an honorary member of the V-Strom Club, which is really funny because I got this, I got this award. Uh, you probably won't be able to see it. Awarded to Mark Hooten, Cymark, for proving that lunatics can mix with normal people. <laughs> West Wales meet 2014. Yeah, God bless them. Nice. God bless them. Nice. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but I, I could see that my, my focus was with, with, with BMW because I, I really do like the bikes. Mm. Um, and I, I do have 
I do have a collection. Now I tell the missus I need to have a collection of bikes but so what? I can design the yeah, oh god, yeah. Obviously. So I can design the parts Obviously. for it, Bruce. But it hasn't gone all that well. Um in one of my lusty uh, more illustrious moments and this shows you how I, I throw profit and loss out the window i brought a brand spanking new k1600 gt because oh, yeah. my wife said one day when i was looking at the brochure oh that's a nice color so i bought it and i i only ever designed one part for, for it and you can see that on the on my site as well just yeah. one part and there's a little oil cooler cover uh, and that was it so slinging the financial rule book or indeed common sense out the window um albeit a very dangerous thing to do i had the core business to support me uh and it enabled me to to get to the point now where um hopefully most people and i think most people do because i've i've y- y- your reputation's out there nowadays you can't hide it have have seen it as a really good thing and the business has just grown and grown and grown yeah. um to the to the point where um i, I think that it, it it probably won't ever overwhelm the core business because that's like sort of serious shit into the railway industry mm. and all the other stuff we do um but i'll tell you what it, it's it's really come on great guns it was established 2010 um and there's no way that i could have done a business plan for this there's no way that i could have forecast it if anything i've just done the best uh made the best stuff i possibly could give the best customer service and in some cases i've ridden down to the south coast to help a guy fit a toolbox Mm -hmm. because he struggled with it uh and that a has been a damn good reason for a ride out uh and b it's kind of blown the customer away because they don't normally get that Mm -hmm. you've got the the huge beasts out there wonderlick touratech yeah they're wonderful they've got probably a lot more lasers than i'll ever have but they they will not and they cannot give that 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 level of service that a small to medium-sized enterprise can give yeah and i think that it's really really done as well we we uh we export all around uh the uh, the world uh nippy norman mr norman bertles who's a a, a a a kind chap who i know quite well he's been my distributor now for yeah. a, a great number of years he's very supportive um and of course uh quite recently as you well well, no, no. Um, Stephen and Hex have come along, mm-hmm. um, and uh, they've uh, wonderfully seen um, maybe some value in the brand. Um, and Stephen also likes red wine, by the way. So we're bound to get on. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, that's uh, that's that's another uh, another dimension um, and a new chapter for us you you um, touched you touched earlier on something the the made in the uk i mean that certainly for me these days made in the uk adds a, a huge weight to a brand for me because i i want to support british products i want to support mm-hmm. british uh, manufacturing british productivity and i actually didn't realize i've heard of cymark years ago i heard about cymark when i was riding my Jixa. And oh, right. I I thought it was like a Dutch type company because were you was was Cymark not I've got doing no stuff? Were you not doing stuff with uh, Jack Lucasen? Did Jack Lucasen not have? Did he not have? Oh, he had a tool of yours or something when he was riding one of his R ones. I remember I remember him talking about Cymark. I'm sure it was Cymark. Could be wrong. Right, okay, but I'd always I'd always associated Cymark with. Jacques and Jacques like from the Netherlands. I, I just assumed you were from over there. And it was only when I was chatting with Stefan and he said, Oh, you know, Cymark, I'm gonna be doing some work with Cymark, they're a British company. And I was like, Are they British? I didn't realise they were British. And obviously now we've been introduced and, and it's gone from there. But yeah, I yeah. personally I had a massive weight to that. Like that I think it's fantastic. You know, you're your British company, you're fabricating here in the UK. Great. Yeah, I, I wish there was more like us, and there are a few, and and the the wonderful, and I wish them all the best. Um, 
we're a dying breed simply because mm. of the Pacific Rim uh, manufacturing, where yeah. they they stack them very high and they make them very very cheaply, and that's great. If you want that stuff, you, you can't knock it, and I support anybody who does that. But the minute you need to go to something bespoke, and I have made tools, so there's a good chance that I might have made tools for somebody over in in the Netherlands. Mm. Um, it, it, that's the point when it becomes a completely different animal and uh it's great to see the people support cymark um i've got a couple of guys uh who now really uh they're, they're employed by the the industrial side of cymark uh but they uh it, with regards to mick certainly he's exclusively bike parts he's got the same values as me uh he's also a biker and um it, it's it's just if i could make wave of magic magic wand and and do the business i want to do it would be making bike parts it really would uh because the rewards are fantastic back in the early days i used to go to the bmw meets when i had time uh and yeah i'd i'd, I'd hug babies and sign boobies it was <laughs> it was it was it was it was fantastic i i loved it um and i'm hoping to get to get back there i've had to to bring you more up to date uh, the industrial side of the of the business is is looked after by um, a lovely lady called Catherine, uh, and she started here as a receptionist, and she's now uh, she's now um, a director of the industrial company Cymark, wow. um, because I, I want her to carry the name on uh, when I'm too old and too drunk uh, to to be able to to do it. Uh, and it was also my my get out strategy uh, as well because I could leave her, I could give it all to her because my my family didn't want it, uh, mm. they'd seen what it done to my liver, um, and I could I could pass it on to pass it on to her. But but very sadly, she uh, about a year ago had her own challenges with with the awfulness that we know as, as cancer. Oh, um, yeah, I know. But, but the wonderful thing is that she's back at work. Mm -hmm. uh, which is wonderful it's been a very long year over a year for all of us especially her um and i i had to sober up and come back and do her job mm -hmm. as best i could mm -hmm. while she took a year out to, to fight this 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 awfulness so um i'm i'm now hoping uh looking forward to to ease back into um drunkenness uh which is wonderful uh but i also want to keep my hand in um especially now hex have got an involvement to mm. make sure that i i do uh i do i do right for for them um and that was something that i i couldn't have planned uh, mm. uh you couldn't have been in any business um uh business plan but a, a long time ago oh crikey way before the pandemic I uh, I bought some Hex products. I bought the Easy Can. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you've got one on your bike. Yeah. Um, and I thought, wow, what a brilliant piece of kit! It's really well made. I love it to bits. Um, and I started up a, a communication with Hex over in South Africa, um, and they asked me if if I'd do some beta testing for them. Of course, I'd be delighted. So I was doing some beta testing for them um, on one of the GSs I had at the time. And uh, at the end of it, they were very grateful. I was very grateful. Um, sorry, it was a privilege. Um, and the guy said, "Think, I think you might want to speak to our our CEO." And I said, "Well, with the greatest respect, you know, um, I don't think a CEO would, would want to speak to me because a, I drink a lot, and b, I smell of cabbage." So anyway, um, out out the blue, my phone rings one day, and it was Stephen. Mm -hmm um and he said oh, i'm giving you a number and we, we we chatted uh i was stood to attention because of my military days of course uh <laughs> and then the covid covid hit us and it just just we, we never stayed in contact there was, i guess there was no need to he he's a very busy man i had stuff to do um and then towards the end of last year uh i bought the 1300 mm -hmm. and i thought right i'll make some bracketry for it for uh aftermarket lights and um i think i sent an email to to stephen and i said um i don't know if you've got any input on this because uh you need a controller uh and uh, uh the great guy that he is says crikey mark yeah i remember you how are you doing uh as it happens we're looking 
looking for somebody uh, to to help us with our our, our metal work moving forward. Uh, obviously, he'd done his uh, uh, due diligence. Who wouldn't? Uh, and he said we'd be delighted if if you would come on board. So um, that was an opportunity for me, really, to yeah. to show him what I could do, and that's falling into a um, uh, two distinct areas. One area is the uh, the, the normal industrial manufacturing of his of his parts, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen this and the parts that we 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 yeah. do. It's got the Cymark logo on. You see, so, yeah. If there's anything that gets the blood <laughs> pounding, Bruce. It's the Cymark logo. Once again, if the if the bank manager knew that, and I think it's over my shoulder, that printer. Yeah, the bank manager knew that I I spent eight thousand pounds on a printer. So I could print Cymark on the bracket. Yes, that would be another beating I would get because I've got no no sense when it comes to it. But Stephen liked it, and of course I could put the hex logo on it too. Um, and that's that's the normal. That's that's kind of bread and butter. That's what I do. That's what the factory does. It's it, we manufacture stuff. But in addition to that, uh, I've been able to uh, assist, assist Stephen in R and D. Mm. Now. Um, in in probably nearly every case, if a company goes to another company and wants them to do R and D for them, uh, it it costs money. It's yeah. quite expensive, um, and um, I was delighted. And I don't think he believed me at first. I was delighted to say because I'm impassioned about what I do. You just tell me what you want. You don't even have to buy it off me. Just tell me what you want, and I'll make it at night times and weekends because I love making stuff and I'll send it to you. And if it helps, you're great. Um, and uh, that's actually going on to this day. In fact, I'm going down to see him at the ABR rally on Saturday oh, yeah. uh, with some samples for some brackets that he's looking at further down the line. Uh, and, and that for me is, is absolutely wonderful. It's why I'm here because I love making stuff and, um, um long long will that hopefully continue yeah and we're also sponsored by the influencer store now i've got some blurb to read out for them the influencer store helps you build your brand big or small providing you with a solution and apparel we help you to increase your fan base while supporting you with starting your own influencer clothing line with nothing more than just an idea and a design and there are no hidden costs for more info come check us out at the or drop us an email at online at influencerstore.co.uk for more information now all my current merch over at teapot1.com that is all handled by Roger and Charlotte and the family over at the Influencer Store. So thank you for all your support. And lastly, a big shout out to all of you who are either watching a podcast or listening just now on your platform of choice. If you can like, share with your mates, tell people about the podcast and help spread the word, that really does help. And if you're listening on things like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, if you can follow and leave a review or rating, five star is preferable of course then that would be absolutely fan dabby all right folks let's get back to the podcast your genuine nature and your uh, uh your ap approachfulness is that a word approachability how Whoa. approachable you are that is something that everybody i'm gonna blow smoke up your arse here oh, the second i mention either your name or the company Cymark. Anyone that has dealt with you personally, everybody says that. Like, you're a top bloke. You're a very down-to-earth, genuine bloke. So, you know, like, that for me, as a customer, you know, as a, uh, yeah. as a potential customer especially, to hear people saying that about someone who owns a business, you know, and, and yeah. the business themselves, that adds a massive weight for me. Because I, I really do hold a lot of weight towards, like, customer service, customer care, all that sort of stuff. Because oh, I yeah. think it's something that's it's kind of lacking in this day and age, particularly because the vast majority of the bits and stuff we just buy as a consumer, it is it is made overseas. It is made over in China, just mass yeah. produced. And you know, if there's any issue, either just send you another one. It's just it's just it's just well, I know yeah. the place it's just sent. But I would much rather yeah. invest in I'd much rather pay my money for a good bit of kit that is made mm. by someone that actually cares about yeah not not only so the customer I. but the product itself eh? you know and it's made yeah. there in the uk i think brilliant i love it love it 
You need to big that yeah, up massively. Yeah. You got to big the made in the UK part up. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And what it, it wasn't designed. It's just, a, I guess, a manifestation of how I would like to be treated, and mm. how I would like my my bits to to be done. And uh, old the, school the values, I've isn't met, it? Yeah, yeah. The, the people I've met have been wonderful. Uh, do, you, do you know about the crowd up at Moffat at, at the Bucklew Arms? Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I was up seeing them yeah, last well, month, month uh, before. Yeah, I'm, I'm very close to the to the family, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to Morocco, hopefully in November. Um, and if you if you ever see the, the the dog box that Dave, that's the father of the family, has got, um, yeah. it, it's out there in, on YouTube. Um, I I designed and made that so he could take his dog on the back of his on the GSA. Back. Brilliant. Uh, and and that's an, something else which which I fell into uh, when I was riding up to the uh, to the west coast. Where I, if I don't go abroad, I tend to do a lot of my biking up on the west coast of Scotland because it's mm. beautiful. Yep. It's really, really nice. And um, and it's nice to, to ride through Glasgow and not get beaten up as well by people <laughs> who I serve with. <laughs> um, and uh, I called in there uh, one day. I was staying overnight because it was a bit of a long haul up to Loch Lomond from where I was. And um, I didn't know about the place. And um, Clint, uh, one of the sons, came out and said... Uh, uh, have you just signed in? Are you, you, Mark Hooten? I thought I'd done something wrong. Yeah, I thought I'd ridden over the the hotel cat or something, uh, and I sheepishly said, "Yeah." And he said, "Crikey!" He says, "Well, I've got to, I've got to uh, introduce you to my dad and my brother because we've got all your parts on our bikes." <laughs> and I went, "Really?" He says, "Yeah," and and that was the start of a wonderful business, but really heavily majoring on on friendship uh that's gone on now for a, a great number of years and i love those guys those guys love me uh, and the support they've given me like people like yourself and other people who resonate uh to with what i do uh they've put big uh, advertisements on the side of the building for cymark um a lot of people know me through them Mm -hmm. um, I've been up there many, many weekends and I've had many, many people come up to me and uh, it's just been great to talk to them and um, uh, they've been very interested in what I've done and a few it's people a have said... It's a hotel, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful place. It, it's probably, in my mind, but I would say this uh, because they are very dear to me, it's probably the best biking hotel in the whole country. Mm. Uh really is superb they're all bikers they all care about what they do they're all very very dear to me um and um uh they get me drunk and keep an eye on me mm. <laughs> <laughs> what, what 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 more could you possibly want sold where do i say <laughs> yeah you was um we, we were chatting about you actually when i was up there last time i was chatting with dave and um I think I think I saw the Cy Mark sign. Might have seen the Cy yeah. Mark sign, and I said, "Oh, yeah, Mark's coming on the the podcast for a chat." And uh, yeah, Dave was saying that you were good mates. In fact, I think yeah. he said, I think he mentioned about Morocco actually that you were going off to Morocco. Yeah, that, that's that's right. We we were off to Corsica, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it got this this um, bit between his teeth on on Morocco, and I've never been to Morocco. Uh, and he said, "Look, you know, let's 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 go." Um, ferries ferries were booked to leave on the first of November, and it's me, Dave, uh, and Polly and Clint, the two sons, and Blue the dog, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and the ferry leaves on the first of November, but it's been cancelled for operational reasons. So Dave's dealing with it. Um, so I don't know if he's going to have to rebook. Now, the thing is, the thing is, we can't leave it much more after the 1st of November because I've got to be back by the middle of November to go on a cruise with my wife. And my wife has said to me, and all the boys know what she's like because they love her more than they'll ever love me. My wife has said to me, if you're not back in time, I'm going to kill you. And I'm going to kill all your mates. <laughs> um now, now, now the, as I said, the, the lads love her as much as what I do. Uh so the plan is we're all go to we're all dick off to Morocco and they are going to escort me to the port in Morocco and make sure that I get on the ferry you get home. for Europe because they think that if they do that, I've got a good chance of getting back 
and they won't get killed by my wife. <laughs> so that's the plan. But it's now up in the air because the ferry's been cancelled and I can't leave it too late because if I'm not back in time, we're all dead men. So we'll was that see. The, if... Was that a Tangier ferry you were getting? Um, I, I, I don't think it was. Um, you going across all the, the route, sweater or the route in it is from from it's going from Gibraltar. Uh huh. Um, what looks like a, uh, across the, the shortest stretch between yeah. Europe. Ah, uh, okay. So it was probably going to be the Soweta cross, and then I'll just serve us to Soweta. Um, oh yeah, that that's the short one. That's like I think that's about half hour, forty five minutes or something. So the one I, oh, okay. I I usually do. It goes to Soweta, which is like a Spanish enclave right on the very north of Morocco. Okay, and then you you basically you ride through Soweta. It takes about ten minutes, and then you get to a land border into Morocco. Oh. Dead easy, dead straightforward, no dramas at all. If you go Tangiers, that's like an hour and a half ferry. That's a much, much yeah. bigger ferry. That goes to Tangiers. And then it's <clears throat> it's quite a clinical border. You know, it's really, really, really easy. It's a typical sort of off the ferry. Same as when you arrive in Spain at Santander or Bilbao. It's the same sort of thing. The yeah. Soweta one's yeah. a bit more... Um, Bit more meaty, it feels like you're overlanding, you know, because you're you're doing a land crossing over. It's I like it. I like Soweta. It's it's good. Do you know where you're going yeah. in Morocco then? Uh Atlas Mountains. Uh-huh. Uh and that's all I can fit in before I've got to get back to Europe. Uh but the lads, Dave and Polly and Clint and Blue the Dog, uh, they're going down the, the length of um uh, of uh, of the country, and it's actually mm -hmm. quite thin, which I'm sure you already know. Yeah. And it runs down the coast of, of Africa. So they want to go down to the most southern part of Morocco yeah. and come back, and they're going for a wonderful four weeks, which is Beautiful. probably what you need to do it justice. I, I would love to go for four weeks. In fact, in, in, a, uh, in a very dangerous moment, um, I did try and... Uh, cancel the cruise, um, but I bottled it because if my wife would have found out, if I would have said, "Oh my, oh my love, they've gone and cancelled the cruise," oh dear, never mind, I'll have to go to Morocco for four weeks. Um, if she would have found out, she would have killed me and all the boys up at, at Moffat. So uh, I bottled that, um, <laughs> and I'm just happy to to to, to get what I'm what I'm going to get yeah. really. Yeah, Morocco's awesome. I've, I've been there quite a few times now. It's it's awesome. You need to you gotta go places like um Wazazat, uh Zud Falls, head to Marzuga right over in the southeast, yeah. which is like the gateway to the Sahara there. It's just beautiful. Literally the the hotels that they have, they they look onto the sand dunes of the Sahara. It's it's stunning. It's but I've I've normally done that in like June, so it's 49 degrees it's ridiculous <laughs> it's crazy I couldn't, I couldn't. For, four, four years in norway i i tend to yeah. like the, the colder colder climbs so what about in norway were you? Sorry, sorry to interrupt there's a bit of a delay on the zoom apologies yeah whereabouts in norway were you when you were stationed ah, right. out there well, we were based at a place called andelsness which is right. south of bergen Mm -hmm. uh, but during the deployment up into the arctic circle we used to go up to a place called Yurkin ranges and that's really our two main areas of operation up within the Arctic Circle for the exercising. Yeah. Uh, and our barracks was at a place called Andelsness. Okay. So up in the Arctic Circle. The... Sorry, go on. Apologies. Sorry, Sorry go on. Um, uh, and there's now actually cruises to Andelsness. <laughs> yeah, which I'd love to go on because I might bump into an old flame, but I won't, <laughs> I won't send it to the wife. <laughs> <laughs> and we used to have out there winter wives, winter wives. If you took a crate of scotch, because of their really onerous and heavy anti-alcohol philosophy they've got over there, and of course the cost of it, if you took out a crate of scotch, you could you could literally buy, and, and she was happy to do this, you could buy a woman who would take care of all your needs. She would do your washing, she would do your ironing, she would look after you. Mrs. Uh, Hooten isn't uh, listening to this part, obviously. No, hopefully she's not. Uh, allegedly, <laughs> oh, allegedly. Um, so, so when I when I saw Andel's Nest come up on the uh, uh, on this cruise route, uh, I did say I'd love to go back just to 
just have a wander around. See that could Barrett's be very still... expensive, Mark. Very yeah, expensive. Yeah, yeah, it could be actually. Yeah, I'm very, very, <laughs> very, very dangerous. Have you met the wife? No, you haven't. <laughs> Speak to somebody who has, and you'll realise how dangerous it can be. <laughs> yeah. Say, Mark, I remember Say, Mark. Whatever happened to them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right, okay. I think we we know quite a bit about you now. How about we tackle some questions and see yes. where the questions take us? Fantastic. Right, lovely. I mean, you're very capable hands. Well, this is all down to the clan over on Patreon. The questions they put up, I don't pre-read them, Mark, so I've got no idea what they are. Um I trust them. I do trust them, but they can be quite left field sometimes. Sometimes they're to do with who you are and what your 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 business is. Other times they can be totally random. Yeah. Up for it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> let's uh let, let let let's have a go then and see where we go with this. As he gulps some red wine. Ooh. Right, okay. We'll head over to the clan, which is patreon.com forward slash teapot one. First one, Debbie Clegg. How you doing, Debbie? Hi, Bruce. Hi, Mark. Question for Mark. In your experience, what's the most difficult and expensive bike part or parts to produce? And do you worry about the overseas competition as far as cost is concerned? Right, okay. Yeah, good question, actually. Uh, I don't know why I was so fearful. <laughs> right, that's a question in two parts. The first the first answer, yes, it, it's something called the armadillo hugger, um, which uh, is, is uh, the most expensive part both in cost and labor that i've ever 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 designed and made and that came about a long time ago when i got it into my head you've heard of a mud sling haven't you yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh well i wanted to make one of those but not like everybody else i wanted to make it out of small segments of aluminium that had all been tig welded together yeah, wow. already we know it's crackers, but there was no holding me because of the, the single-figure IQ and how I can get the bit between my teeth and how I like this too much. And um, that 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 consumed me. That consumed me for three days. I I did sleep. It was the odd hour on, on the office floor. But what I ended up was um, I moved my desk next to uh, one of my lasers. And these lasers are huge beasts, huge beasts. And I moved my bike, put it on a ramp, and got it up to the level of my desk so that I could measure how I wanted this 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 um this mud sling, this this mud guard to, to to look. Now the problem was problem was not apart from the low IQ, the problem was when you try and make something out of what was probably hundreds of little individual aluminium parts all TIG welded together, the eye will always follow something that's not quite right. Yeah, you know, when yeah. you've got a dent in your car, it sticks out yeah. like a mile. It, it, yeah, it, yeah. And, and I would make one, and it, it wasn't right, because I could see that it wasn't right, and it wasn't right, and it bugged me. So I'd make another one. I'd redesign it. I'd laser it out. I'd, I'd put it all together, and it still wasn't right. And instead of doing the sensible thing and walking away, I continued for three days and three nights until I finally got it right. I didn't sell one, ever. I have not sold one <laughs> armadillo hugger in my life. I don't think I could even give it away, Bruce. But it was probably the most expensive part I've ever made because if you ever have to pay for R and D with with a half million pound laser, yeah, yeah, and all the design work that goes into it, it, it costs an absolute fortune to make one. That's why the Chinese make millions yeah. because it brings the price right down, obviously. Yeah. So uh, to make this this one, and it looked like an armadillo without the snout. That's what it looked like. It was quite bizarre, really. Um, that was the most expensive, the most expensive part that I've ever, ever made. To answer the second question, no, I, I don't worry about Chinese manufacturing at all because we are so million. I never want to worry about Chinese man, manufacturing. If I try and compete with Chinese manufacturing, I will go out of business. Mm. So I don't worry about it at all. They do their thing. 
and I will respect them for what they do. Uh, and I will do my thing and never the twain shall meet. Mm. <clears throat> You're obviously a very creative person. For for you, does does the look and form of whatever it is that you're producing, does that take precedence above everything else for you? It, it's got to uh, it's got to look good and do the job. Is that um, no? Um, to answer your question honestly, uh, it's got to be the best quality I can possibly make it. Mm. Uh, I don't. Uh, it's very kind of you to say that I'm creative. Uh, I I don't think I am. Um, what I've found is that if I try and make it as best as I possibly can, uh, and as expensively as I possibly can, not a lot of people use stainless steel as a material because mm. it's so difficult to work and it's so expensive compared to mild steel. But if you buy mild steel products and powder coat them, when they chip, they go rusty. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I said, right, I'll always make stuff in stainless steel or aluminium. Um, so it's not a it's not a creative flair that I've got. It's a a functional flair where I try and make it as, as good as I can. And I've got to admit, some of the stuff I've, I've made, it's been crackers. Uh you know, some of the stuff you could you could easily use as a Titanic anchor. <laughs> um because it's that over engineered yeah, um, yeah. and i also do a lot of that as well sometimes purposely sometimes accidentally i will over engineer something because i want it to last um and there was a video i think it's on youtube somewhere where i made a light guard and i'm playing baseball with it trying to destruct it and i can't I can't. I'm throwing it off steel skips and I'm playing baseball with it in an effort to try and break it. And I couldn't. No need for that sort of engineering. It's just too excessive. But I did it because I could. Um, and um, I guess if there's any creative um, result from that, it's just simply as a byproduct of, of how robust the item may may look and a lot of people i'm very pleased to say touch wood a lot of people do say that uh my gear is very 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 well made and that mm. it's strong yeah but they do yeah it, i've purposely i've purposely done that so that it lasts have you have you always had this sort of engineering based mindset have you all like did you grow up as somebody that as, as like a kid that tinkered and made stuff or is that something that's come through your time in the, the military? Um, well, I was a communications instructor within the military. Um, so we used to engineer radio nets, but engineering mm. a radio net is completely different Definitely, to engineering yeah. some stuff. Yeah. Um, no, I, I just think that um, I just inherently, genetically love making stuff from a very young age i loved motorbikes i've tried cars by the way i've tried expensive cars but i fall asleep when i'm driving them they are so boring <laughs> they are so boring i've got one car and seven bikes that tells you something wow um so so um cars uh great bikes Nah, cars are a form of transport. Bikes, bikes are a, a wonderful passion. And my first bike was a Honda 90 with the leg shields off of it. Uh, and I was in completely captivated by the mechanicals of it. Mm. I just loved it. I just love riding it. And I used to do it illegally and go down a long road called Scotter Bottom. And when I saw uh, headlights, because I thought it was the fuzz, I would then ride off the road into the ditch and hide in the ditch till they went by mm -hmm. and get out on my bike again and go and ride it. This is like two and three o'clock in the morning. Um, <laughs> and it was great. It was exhilarating. I loved it. And then I had a BSA Bantam. BSA stands for uh, Bloody Sore Ass, yeah. um, uh, And that captivated me as well. Uh, and I must admit, fast forward to today, the old power presses I had were wonderful machines because I could see them and understand them. This laser technology and the other CNC machines I've got, they're all wonderful uh, and they're brilliant, but they, they haven't got the same mechanical appeal to me. Mm. So there's obviously some sort of mechanical leaning 
that I've got. Um, and as it happens, my, my erstwhile partner, going back to the, the origins of Cymark, his father was an engineering instructor at local college. And his father taught me about engineering so that I could at least hold my own. Um, and that also captivated me as well. So, yeah, I, I never knew I had it, but I just like making stuff. And I appreciate I appreciate mechanicals, I guess. Mm. So you, you obviously you moved from the presses and you, you embraced development technology with the lasers. Are you still looking forward? Are you still looking at, right, what's the next development in manufacturing technology? What, what else? What's the next thing? Or are you just, right, lasers do what I need them to do now? What can I do with a laser? Yeah, that's, good. that's a good point. Uh, if I bring Catherine back into this, um, if it was down to me, because... I do have, I'm in business and I don't know how, because <laughs> in a lot of aspects I've got, I've, I've got little or no regard to money. Money to me is a side issue. Yeah. Um, it, it comes about, I'm not doing it primarily to amass money. The money's come along from, as a result of what I've been doing. And that's, mm. that's, that's great. The latest technology, the latest laser I, I wanted to buy a few years ago, but Catherine keeps my feet on the ground, is, is fiber lasers. Uh, and instead of using um, light traveling through a, a gaseous environment, a fiber laser uses what is indicates that the power is transmitted down a, a fiber optic cable, a bit like your, your sky to your, yeah, your house yeah. and stuff like that. And technology has now got to the point where they can pass energy down a fiber optic cable strong enough to cut through 30 millimeter thick mild steel. Yeah, like a wow. knife through butter. Uh, and that's that's the very, very latest, excuse the pun, cutting edge. Uh, and I wanted to go out and buy one because I wanted one because <laughs> I'm silly and low IQ. And Cass said, well, hang on. New. Yeah, shiny and new, shiny. <laughs> shiny uh and Cass said mm, do, do we really want to saddle ourselves with that much debt now bearing in mind i'm i'm, I'm hopefully passing this all over to Catherine. Yeah. i don't want to saddle her with my uh impetuousness on yeah. going out and buying shiny things yeah so we we haven't embraced the latest technology oh my god i'd love to <laughs> uh and 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 sometimes sometimes that's that is that is a good thing, really, uh, because as I said, how I've managed to to last in business with some of the stuff I've done, Bruce, I don't know. How how did you find that transition then from um, from the military to being a self employed businessman? I'm asking oh. because my background is obviously I, I've come from the police. You know, I spent almost twenty years in the police and left that to to become self employed, doing all this. You know, doing videos and yeah. tours and 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 yeah. I've yeah, yeah. over the last sort of four years, I've found it really quite hard to be honest. I, the insecurity side of you know the financial insecurity side of being self employed is something I is is less hard to deal with now but it's always in the back of my mind because i had the yeah, safety net yeah, of yeah. being a, like a government employee before and now you're on your own so how how do you how yeah, have you dealt with that um somebody far more intelligent than me probably our lurcher dog once said to me business is always is <laughs> The wife reckons the dog can outwit me. I'm not too sure about that. Um, uh, business is, is constantly fragile. Mm. Um, and you only ever appreciate this if you're self-employed or you, you're in within a small to medium-sized enterprise. Uh, and I, I struggled. I really, really did. Because I went from an environment where I was looked after. And a lot of, a lot of people who I was friends with uh, they all they all translated it into into the police force. A lot mm. of my friends are police or or ex police because that's where they gravitate to once they've yep. left the military. Yep. No, I, I went off and characteristically did something very very stupid, um, and uh, went went into business. I uh, a, a few people who know me would say that it's. Only, only I would do something as crazy as this because 
uh, I'm a couple of fries short of a happy meal. But they mean that in a nice way. They mean that in a supportive way, but they also mean it in only only somebody like Mark would do stuff like this. So um, I think my 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 philosophy has helped me cope or lack of philosophy uh because a lot of the time i just threw caution to the wind um and and hoped for the best and opened another bottle <laughs> um and that that kind of helped me with the transition but what i found is after uh how long has i been going now 1990 after your over years. 30 years wow. um it's always been fragile it's not actually any easier now by the way as mm. you've just said it doesn't seem any easier now. Um, if we go back a few years, looking at the profit and loss and, and bare business facts like that, they were the halcyon days because now it's so much harder. There's not so much competition, but there's so much more regulatory expense, mm. pensions, insurances, just to name two, uh, that we have not been able to pass on. Um, and it, it's made it even harder. As I said earlier on, my family do not want my business. Mm. My two beloved daughters, one of them's called India after my favorite food. Uh, they do not, they do not want the business at all. Uh, so that's why really I've been very, very lucky with Catherine because she's still damn fooled enough to turn up in the morning and, and, and lead us all. So, yeah, I found the tr transition very difficult, uh, but I also think that because of my nature, it did help me cope with the difficulties difficulties of it, where other people just might have fallen off the edge of a cliff. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is very. It is. I found it a real struggle, and and I've spoken to lots of entrepreneurs and people in similar situations to what we've been in. You know, where you're working for the big corporate, and then you make that leap, and every everyone had basically said, "It's either for you or it's it's not for you." You know, and it's and it's like if you if you're gonna make a go of it, you just have to swing with the punches. You've got to. Duck when duck when the blows come your way. Figure a way around it, and just try not to focus too much on the what ifs. Just deal with it and and keep going forward. Just just keep yeah going. You know, yeah, if I just if I, don't if I had up. to put it if, if I had to put it in two words, I would say tenacity. Yes, because many a time I should have rolled over and just yeah. gave up. Yeah. Many a time, much more intelligent people than I'll ever be would have done that. Uh, tenacity and a good smattering of lunacy, I think, has has helped me cope with it uh, and helped me uh, get get through get through really. But I do agree with you, and I do empathise with you. It is not easy. It doesn't seem to get any easier. In fact, it seems to get harder. Um, and um, we we are now from three locations down to one we're all in the main factory now the industrial side of cymark and also the bike part side of cymark mm. uh, and i must say I, i've uh, i haven't been this this happy for a long time and that's simply because i haven't got two of the locations to worry about yeah so yeah. um yeah it's uh it, it's a it's a very difficult thing and, it, and it, it's certainly not for the faint-hearted it, it really it really isn't it's an adventure as well, though, isn't it? And and it's for me the freedom I now have compared to the freedom I had before. Oh, I can't, I I can't imagine actually going back into the traditional work role again. You know, where I'm working yeah. for somebody else because I'm pretty much, I'm pretty much the master of my own destiny here. Really, you know, it's like it's over when I give up. So you just. You just keep going, don't you? You just figure it out. You, th there's, there's got to be a solution for whatever your end result is, and you just keep chipping at it, and 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 hopefully it'll work out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's clear that you 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 love what you do, and that's wonderful. Oh, God, yeah. Um, and that's what what drives us, what what drives us yeah. all. But I, I could I could retire now, um, with uh, a, a, a modest. Um, income for the rest of my days 
Um, and I guess a, a lot of people here would be a lot happier if I wasn't bimbling around all the time. But <laughs> um, I, I don't I don't think I could because either me or the wife would end up underneath the patio, probably me. So I need, I need a reason to to get up yeah. in the morning to come to work. And now I'm I'm nearly back into uh, semi retirement mode, which is wonderful because it means that Kath's now backing up and running and, and doing yeah. what she needs to do. Um, and I can now do what I want to. And all I want to do really is make stuff and ride my bikes. It's, oh, and uh, and drink. It's it's as simple Obviously. as that. Um, and I'm not necessarily bothered about riding the best of bikes. And me and you can talk for a long time about the 1300, and I do look forward to that conversation. Oh, yes. But as you've, as you've already realised, I have a beloved... 1972 Ukrainian KMZ Dniper sidecar. I saw it in the post, and, yeah. Yeah, and having, having seen you done that recently, I thought, yeah, you'll know what I'm talking about. This particular beast, I often say to people, if you ever want to explore your manhood, come out with me in <laughs> this particular beast because it's got no brakes, it's got speedway tyres on it, Bruce, so it's designed to slide around corners, and every day... It scares me every day I get on it. it. It's a massive death trap. Everybody who knows it will tell you. I, I people only go in it once. People, Mick, who who looks after the bike parts for me in conjunction with me, he went in it once. He flatly refuses to ever go in it again because it is so dangerous. Uh, I nearly died in it. Actually, I nearly died in it. You're selling it. it. A, You're selling it, Mark. You're selling it. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm selling it. I'm selling it. Oh, my. I'll be yeah, up next week. Me. There was a, <laughs> there was a uh, an artillery reunion over on Saddleworth Moor near Manchester, right? And I decided to go to it. Now, now I already knew, despite single figure IQ, I already knew that it was a death trap, a death trap. So I planned ahead, as any good ex serviceman would do. I filled the sidecar up with curry making stuff, the wok. A ballast, tent. obviously. Ballast. 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 I needed that as, as the story will unfold. And lots of emergency wine. And I decided to go on B roads and tracks because it is dangerous. It's dangerous to other road users. Dangerous to me. And I thought, I'll get there. It might <laughs> might take a while. And off I went. Now, this is where this is where the single figure IQ unravels because Lincolnshire is flat. You probably know this because it's bomber country. Mm -hmm. So while I'm on the sidecar, bimbling on a flat road, there's no problems at all. I didn't look ahead to realize that when I got over to the, the Pennines approaching Manchester, mm -hmm. it was going to be up and down. That's when it started to unravel. And I was going down a hill with the uh, sidecar fully loaded with curry, tent, emergency wine, and a few other things. And when I got to the bottom of the hill, I had no brakes at all. Now, the sidecar's on the right-hand side. So if it was a left-hander, I went, I turned the handlebars like that, and all the all the, all the the weight went over onto the sidecar, and I got round. Mm -hmm. It was quite scary, but I got round. And I'm going down this particular hill, and it's got a, a, a right-hand bend at the bottom oh, of it. Oh, God. Now then, on the sidecars, you probably found out, if you turn the handlebars to the right at the wrong time, the sidecar lifts up. Yeah. It's a very terrifying thing. It's if you've really easy it, to do. It's too easy to do. Too easy to do. So I'm piling down this this this, this road. It was a B road. <laughs> no brakes. There was so much weight in the sidecar. I had no brakes at all, and I had to go around this corner. And I genuinely thought that I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. And I turned the handlebars, and the sidecar lifted up. And I put my hand on it and put all my weight on it, including my wine gut, and I managed to get the sidecar down and get around the corner. And I stopped that shortly after to take a moment. I think I started smoking again. Uh, I certainly <laughs> cracked open some wine, and I thought I nearly died. That's your ballast, there. Mark. It's a ballast. That's right. I nearly died. So I got to the artillery reunion, and all the lads who know me say, "Why did you do that?" And well, uh, I just did it. And uh, thankfully, the bike wouldn't start at the end of the weekend, so I had to get recovered back to Scunthorpe. <laughs> And that probably saved my life. So yeah, it's it's a it's. But you a, still love it. I love it to bits. I've got these. I've got 
the, the twelve fifty. I've got the twelve hundred. I've got an XR. I've got an R ninety. I've just got the thirteen. Um, and the I will BMW still fan then. Yeah, I will still jump on this Ukrainian trap of death Brilliant. and ride this trap of death to work. It's wonderful. And I came on it today because I thought, no, I need to do. I need to do this justice. So yeah, it's 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 crackers. It's mental. Um, it's it's horribly made. The welding is disgusting, um, but I just I just love it. I just love it to bits. The side uh, that was the first time I'd ever ridden a sidecar was um, up at the sidecar experience on those Euros. And um, well, yeah. I mean, if, if you watch the vid, you see I, I didn't stop laughing and giggling like a schoolgirl for two days. It was just, but it. it it is so. It is such an alien experience compared to riding a bike. It's not like riding a bike, is it? it well, isn't no, it? Isn't it's, it? It's, 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 it, it, it's not. Yeah, turning's totally different. You don't. You don't lean. You. You sort of turn, but you turn. Is it turning to the left? You use the throttle. Well, you use the throttle both times, don't you? You accelerate to turn to the left, and you ease off to turn to the right with the Euros. Yeah, that's that, that, that's right. Otherwise, it, it it just it starts to fight with itself. Yeah. Uh huh. You know, like there's yours a time. And... Yeah, on, on mine with the sidecar on the right, which terrifies ah, people because yeah, yeah. when they go in the sidecar, when you go to overtake something, they, yeah. they've got a big Foden truck coming head on, <laughs> and it's really funny. They, I they, didn't well, notice they start that screaming. yours is on the right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they start they start screaming, and it makes you laugh. Um, uh, and uh, if if you start to get into problems on a right hander, you open the throttle rather than close the throttle, because if you close it, it starts to or tries to tie itself in a knot. Yeah, yeah. If that's the best description, um, so they they are they are wonderful things. In fact, Dave will put Moffitt, if you ask him next time you see him, he went on one, he'll never go on one again in the rest of his life. <laughs> that they are they are they are something very, very special, that's for sure. Does your um, one have the two wheel drive in it, like the Urals do? Uh no, no, it hasn't. It's got a reverse gear. Uh-huh. Uh it's got a reverse gear, but it hasn't got uh it hasn't got that that uh that driven wheel. Yeah. Uh by by the sidecar, unfortunately. Um and it's 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 also sprayed in uh British Army Green as well. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. Uh and uh yeah, it's 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 mental. It's mental. Absolutely mental. Mate, it puts a smile it. on your face. That's the main thing, isn't it? That's the bike. Yeah, That's the bike for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a scream into my lungs. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Right, Debbie's got a second question. Question for both. Sure. You can only choose one flavour of crisps for the next five years. What would it be? Oh. Oh. Um, one flavour of crisps. <laughs> smoky bacon. Well, smoky bacon for you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Malbec and smoky bacon. There you go. That's it. Job done. Uh, she says, wishing you a happy evening. Cheers, Deb. Thank you very much, Debbie. Thanks for your question. Next one, Charlie Callard. Evening, gents. How you doing, Charlie? Hope you're both fitting well. So a couple of questions. Firstly, for Mark, what's been your favourite part to produce and is there a particular one you've yet to conquer? You will take a pause to think about my favourite part because I love all my babies. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think, I think, I think my favourite part actually was a um, a rear seat cover for once again Dave Smith up at Moffat. Uh, he's from Zimbabwe and he's got a a lot of connections with the culture over there uh and there's a particular tree that he had a photograph of and he wanted this laser profiling into a uh pillion seat cover plate uh along with his adventure bike um and and him and foolishly i took that on um and that took me two weeks to design i've never let him forget it to draw because it was that complicated um and the, the satisfaction i got out of making just that one part um i think is is more than any other part i've 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 made now i think he's long since weighed the stainless in to go towards his retirement fund which i don't mind uh but i keep on reminding them that it took me 
two two weeks to to actually draw up such was the the complexity um of it uh so yeah i got a lot of satisfaction out of that because it was difficult to do mm-hmm. um yeah was that the question was there something else yeah yeah and he said there was another one is there a particular one you've yet to conquer oh yeah don't give away any trade um, secrets obviously um that's that's kind of driven that's kind of driven by customers uh because uh i get a lot of people contacting me saying mark will you make this mm. for me um so my my next part i don't actually know what it is yet i'll leave that down to the customer to tell me and and i either if if i think yes i want to try this i'll take it on um and i'll uh i'll probably just charge for what it will cost for the part anyway uh but i'll, I'll take it on as a challenge to to, to try and do it mm-hmm. um there, there's nothing that i can think uh which is really really rich really itchy to me that i want to do apart from um i made it i've already made uh, or designed a few parts for the 1300 um one of my most popular parts uh has been the the uh, front crud protector which i made for the 1200 and the 1250 um the 1300 as you well know has got a different engine configuration yeah. um and um i'd like to make an engine front engine protector for uh for that uh can't seem to get round to to doing it so that's the only other one apart from customers saying mark will you design and make this for me that i've really got a, a an itch to to do hmm so what are you doing for the 1300 then? Oh, obviously, I've got your TFT th- anti-theft brace. Thank oh, you very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, other than that, what, what are you doing for the 1300? Um, well, it's, it's it's bizarrely nothing I'd really strongly recommend. Uh, which, well, I'm being yeah, honest. Uh, the, the only thing <laughs> I would recommend, and if people don't take my recommendation, I send it to them anyway as I've shown you with the brace, because you really do need brace. Yeah. Uh, these TFT screens, and I'm not doing this as a Marcus employee, it's, it's awful. Uh, they're getting stolen in the city, especially off the scooters now, because I've now done them, uh, designed them for the scooters. But apart from the 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 really required um, anti-theft brace for the, for the screen, um, I, I make a... Um, uh, what's it called? The uh, X X three D shackle lock, the one that you can't get through with a sitting disc. Oh, uh-huh, um, the light lock X three. Ah, that's the one. Yeah, I've got one of those. So because it weighs a ton, uh, I've gone and designed and made a holder for it, so it sits um, just below the rear pillion seat. Really, right. Uh, yeah, it was on site. If you, if you, I'll have, have a look. Uh, if you ever lose the will to live and you want to have a look, on the other side, uh, I make and this this is more uh, this is more useful. If I'm honest, um, I, I've redesigned the, the toolbox, which is quite popular on the 1200 and the 1250 mm. uh, that that sits on the left hand side of the 1300. Uh, I've got my tire repair kit in there. Um, I've also made a pillion seat box. That, that fits onto the uh, uh, the back of the bike. Um, and I think so far, four items, uh, that's uh, that, that's all that I've I've made. Oh no, sorry, five, uh, because I designed some um, uh, auxiliary light mounting brackets yeah. uh, as well. Yeah, sorry. So that, that's what I've done for the 1300. But it's, it's a wonderful bike. I've had, awful trouble with mine uh really really awful, awful trouble with so many parts replaced i think i've got a new bike uh, but you get that when you get the first bike i understand yeah. that uh but it's it's a bike that doesn't need as much stuff on it as the previous ones do like for instance um i did quite well uh, and sold quite a few of the screen strengthening brackets mm, because the screen that. on the 1200 and the 1250 rattles like yeah you wouldn't believe um but thankfully bmw have seen this 
and they've now redesigned the screen so it doesn't rattle as much, so it doesn't need the brackets. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I dare say there's a few other things I could design for the 1300, but nowhere near uh, the quantity that I've I've done for the for the previous models. Gotcha. Okay, then we've we've brought up the 1300. What issues have you had with yours then? Because I've had a couple with mine. Oh, baby. Hang on, I just need a sip of wine. <laughs> have right, you had I'm, the I'm gonna, failure to start issue? I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna remain as as, as professional as I can because I want to. So I'm gonna give a, a balanced view. Yep, absolutely. Because I think that's what I should do. Mm-hmm. The bike's fantastic, but there's a huge butt. There is it really is a huge butt. The bike, and the first issue I had was with uh, well, the major issue. There's a few little issues, you know, about the relay that they had to yeah, replace. Start because it relay. Catching, yeah, yeah, little, little issues like that. The first big issue I had was with the the, the lipo battery, and the bike wouldn't start on occasion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same. And um, if if I if I do suffer with anything, it's it's impatience, and being out somewhere on a bike that won't start um it is quite annoying it happened to me a couple of times i reported it to to my to my dealership who are very good by the way very good because i i want to give a balanced view um but um when um when i broke down the second time i i carry one of those battery booster packs do, do you yeah. know the ones yeah yeah i've got one um mm-hmm. And I, I put the battery booster on on the bike and started the bike and got home. To find out later on that because I'd, I'd done that, I'd voided the warranty on the LiPo battery. Yeah, I know, I know. So so I said, look, let, let, let's be fair about this. I don't want a BMW bash. Uh, I want to be fair. Uh, I want to be as unbiased as I can. Uh, what was I supposed to do? And they said, well, you were supposed to ring BMW Assist. Mm-hmm. Now, that's all well and good, but if I'm in a dangerous situation or it's raining cats and dogs or I've got no signal, I've got no choice yeah. but to do what I did to get the bike yeah. going. Now, um, that was resolved by the battery being replaced. Thank you very much, BMW. I do appreciate that. Um, and um, there was that and... Uh, couple other issues that were resolved but the bike has spent more time in the garage than it spent in between my legs but the biggie the biggie the biggie i had was a and this is all this is all of all this is all documented so this is all true it went for 600 mile service and i needed new brake pads oh me too rear brake pads yeah so i said hey guys there's something wrong with the bike and at first uh they said bah, don't worry about it it's probably an anomaly we'll put some new brake pads in we won't charge you happy days so off i went very happy customer at 900 miles because i was then focused on it i needed more brake pads and i said look there's and i'm compressing this now because uh, i've had the bike since late october um and i said look there's something wrong with the bike they knew there was something wrong with the bike The lady who dealt with the after sales knew there was something wrong with the bike. The technician knew something was wrong with the bike. The dealership cat knew that there was something wrong with the bike. Yeah. And they said, okay, we'll we'll put it to investigation. So uh, they contacted me. Uh, I'd gone away on holiday and they had it for two weeks. They'd done a load of other, sort of a load of other problems out on the bike. And I uh, I took a phone call, which I found incredulous. And I went over to the dealership, and it was explained to me that there was nothing wrong with the bike whatsoever. The bike was absolutely fine, and they thought it was me. It thought They thought it was my riding. They thought I couldn't ride the bike, and I was had my foot on the brake all the time. Yeah. Now, uh, I, I, I took it I took it well. Uh, but I, I wasn't happy with that. So I went away and I did two things. I got an examiner mate of mine who produced 
a statement saying that if he was to test me on any given day, he would expect me to achieve Rosper Gold. Mm -hmm. And I carried out a scan of the bike using my professional 911 to find out that the ABS pump was defective. Mm -hmm. What it was doing was putting the brakes on. Not mm -hmm. all the time, but like that. Yeah. Or it was oscillating, oscillating and wearing through the brakes. So I went back to the dealership and said, look, actually, it's not my riding. Here's an appraisal of my riding. I can, I know how to ride a bike. Mm -hmm. And also, here's a fault, which I've found. I found that there's a fault with the ABS pump. They rescanned the bike. They found the fault. They replaced the ABS unit. And now the bike is absolutely fine. And I've gone back to them and said, look, can we can we look at some sort of restitution here? Because here's the facts. This is what you said. This is what the actual outcome is. I think we need to chat about this. And now, very sadly, very sadly, I'm being stonewalled, which is disappointing um, because they know it's not right. Mm -hmm. I know it's not right. But they are now not communicating with me or just fobbing me off when really they should sit down and say, right, Mark, okay, we stumbled here. What can we do? And I will say something like, give me a new set of brake pads and that will be absolutely fine by me. Yeah, that'd be this. Do you want to yeah. say which dealership it is? Feel free. Yeah, uh, I, I don't want to at this time. Fair enough, um, no dramas. But because I, I, I need to be as fair as I possibly can be, and I, I want that. to give them the chance to resolve it. Now, uh, if they resolve it to my satisfaction, I will be the first to go on to social media and explain it and explain it in a fair, fair way so that people can make their own judgment and say this is what they did at the end of it. Mm. If they continue to stonewall uh, and fob me off, uh, then at that point I will probably I will probably name them, but I'll do it in such a way that it's professional, mm -hmm. it's as fair as I can make it, and I give a balanced appraisal of this particular dealership because I yeah. don't want anybody else getting fobbed off. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in this because uh, I've had exactly the same issue with the rear brake pads and disc. And I know really? at least, yeah, and I know I've heard at least one other person on social media. Somebody somebody contacted me and asked me before um, before I'd found out on my own bike and, and asked about it. And I was like, no, I've had no issue. And then uh, there it was. I remember, was it the 600 miles? Yeah, well, at the 600 mile service, exactly the same as you. They they said yeah. to me, "Oh, your rear brake pads um, are getting close to needing change." And I and I laughed and I said, "Don't don't be yeah. daft. It's not even 600 miles yet." And they were like, "Oh, well, yeah. they're showing they're showing where." And I was like, "Well, that you know, I don't know how because I never I don't use the rear. I only use the rear brake." for really slow speed maneuvering. So if I'm commuting in town, that's the only time yeah. I'm, I, I yeah. rarely rear brake, you know, in a, yeah. in a corner or anything at speed. Um, and then it went in for a 6,000 mile service and same thing. They said, oh yeah, your rear brake pads need changing and your rear disc um, is thin. And I was like, that's not right. This can't be right because no. I don't use no. the rear brake. I very rarely use it. And then the bike was in, the bike was in at about 10 and a half, 11,000 miles. Um, fairly recently, um, a couple of months ago, and uh, it needed, I can't remember what it needed. It was having something done anyway. It, maybe it was the starter thing or it was having something done and they did a whole walk around in the bike. You know how they do? They do, well, oh, they yeah, just yeah, did a, yeah, a, a whole check of it. And again, he said, oh, your, 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 your rear brake disc is too thin. It's now at the point where it needs changed. And I, and I said, well, no, I don't, I don't want it changed yet. Um, I'll leave that till the 12,000 mile service, but something's not right here. We need to look at this because this isn't right. Like I've, I've owned three GSs before I've done probably coming close to 120, 130,000 miles on those GSs. And I've never replaced any brake disc ever on any of them. Each of those bikes has done 30, 40,000 miles and the rear, the yeah, rear disc yeah. has never needed replacing the pads. Yeah. But never the disc. And, um, 
And I was like, this ain't right. Something's not right here. So I'm going to push that with him. I'll definitely push. And I'll, I've got yeah. the GS911. I'll, I'll give that a little scan and see if I'm getting the same issue. Yeah, yeah, please. I, I was going to say, if you haven't got one, and because I like to have a ride out, I would ride down to you with mine and, and scan your bike for you. Mm. Um, so uh, please do a scan and, do, and yeah. it will reveal, uh, and it's, you'll see it'll stand at a mile, uh, a- ABS issues. Mm. Uh, and if you get that, then you want to bring that to their attention. Um, what I can't understand is that when I did that, they then miraculously found the fault. Yeah, I know. That's what stood out to me why didn't they find that because they use the same sort of software don't they it's the same thing well well, well, they do and uh my claim is you shouldn't have a customer telling you what's wrong with the bike i know it's new Mm. but you you shouldn't you shouldn't have that but yeah um they've gone into very sadly uh without naming names uh bmw tend to have a philosophy of knee-jerk reaction reaction is actually blame the customer Mm. and say it must be you must be your fault the bike's fine which i don't want people to get fobbed off with so yeah 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 bruce do a scan and see what that reveals Mm. uh and if it does reveal an abs fault print it off take it to them and say well look you know there is something wrong with the bike because that that isn't that isn't right yeah i I mean i'm always interested to see how other people get dealt with by bmw because I i think you know, I'm in a very fortuitous position now that when I walk into a BMW dealership, there tends to be somebody there who knows of the channel and, you know, is aware yeah. that I have an online presence. And you definitely do yeah. get treated differently, for sure. But I'd like to, I, I certainly would have liked to have thought that most people that go to BMW get treated roughly the same. But it's interesting to hear that from you. And yeah, I've heard a couple of people say that they weren't that impressed, and I'm like, mm, just go to a different dealership. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Some, sometimes a different dealership can make all the difference. But to try and to try and be fair, which is what I always try and do uh, on social media, people have asked me about it, and I've said, yeah, the, the bikes. I've had nothing but problems with it, but it's a fantastic bike. And they said, well, how can you, you know, say that about a bike that's so, so crap? Um, but I've tried to be fair. I've tried to be balanced. And in my personal opinion, and I've ridden a few bikes over my time, I I don't have to take my, my souped-up XR out anymore because my 1300 is is possibly even quicker. It's a rocket um, ship. A it, rocket it's a, ship. It's an amazing bike. I, I absolutely love it to bits i really really do uh i think it's absolutely brilliant i really do love it fantastic the only the only issues i've had is that that rear brake thing um and the bike not starting i think i think they're the only issues and the bike not starting it was like i would say one in two before really really frustrating then they changed the starter really and it was like maybe one in five, one in six times it wouldn't start. Um, I took it back. Yeah. They they said they had a look and couldn't find anything, but the bike then now, touch wood, almost starts every single time now. I've never had an issue, so I don't know what went on there. For me, for me, the, the, the negatives with the bike, and I'm going to be doing a vid on this, are it's still not engaging enough. It's still not a KTM. It's not a Ducati. You know, it's 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 not even the Africa Twin in terms of engagement, and and I put that down to that exhaust. Like I I took the bike to the Picos in April, and I stretched its legs. You know, I had some fun there, and the bike can't breathe. You know, it's gasping for air. You can hear it wheezing. It wants air because of that big cat and all the Euro Five emissions. Yeah. So I bought. I've bought a full DCAT system from an Italian company called QD. So I've got that in the garage. I'm going to fit that, and I want to see what difference that makes. Just if it, you know, the change in the engine note, if it's a little bit more throaty and a bit of a girl and a pop and a fart yeah. on it, and if it can breathe a bit yeah, better, you, you, maybe that will yeah, do it. You, yeah, you, you've brought you've brought to uh, uh, to the conversation something which I, I, I agree with. I 
um, I sold it now, I had an F800 Adventure, and it mm. felt like there was a potato shoved up the exhaust. Yeah. When I decatted and refueled, and I'll come on to refueling, so I think it's important, um, it completely transformed the bike. Now, um, my 1200 GSA is decatted, my 1250 isn't. Um, I, I've got an XR, a Gen, Gen 1 XR. Um, it didn't feel as if there was a potato that up its backside, but I did notice that, as you've just identified, it had breathing problems. Mm. Um, so I, I decatted that, uh, and I took it to Andy Redmayne, who does the GP bikes over in Lancashire. Um, and uh, the bikes, you will probably already know, that they, they tend to run as lean as they possibly can anyway. Yeah. Yeah, you start to decat, it starts to run even leaner. We get back to the days when we had scooters and we tuned them, and the engine would melt. So um, I, I decatted my XR and I refueled it at the same time. Now, what that produced was a much better or more appropriate uh, AFR um, air fuel ratio, uh, and as a byproduct, it produced 168 at the back wheel. <laughs> at the back wheel uh, yeah no uh it, it it it's it's nearly in the same league as my kmz deniper for trying to kill me yeah. it's it's nearly it's near it's not as good but it's nearly <laughs> as good when it comes to trying to end my life uh and it's a cracker's bike but what it taught me is that Quite a few BMW bikes, because of legislation and Euro 5 or 6 or whatever, tend to suffer from this, this breathing. Yeah. And if you ease the breathing, it does transform the bike to some to various degrees, but you've also got to be mindful of, because they're very lean anyway, about them running far too hot. So uh, please let me know how you get on. Yeah, well... But I would consider, uh, I would consider getting it checked out to make sure that, by virtue of removing the cat and giving it much easier breathing pathways, that it's not making it run too hot or too lean at the engine, uh, and considering refueling. But then you've got a problem of messing about with it and it'll know that you've messed about with it and it will report you to the boys in blue because you've messed about with it so it's a, it's a difficult thing to to try and remove that potato yet try and keep it properly pro properly properly fueled yeah. for me so far on the 13 I, I haven't been in a situation where i'm yet to find it find it breathless Mm. um i still i still find it with loads of character though to be honest i've never ridden the ktm so i can't really compare and contrast but at the moment i'm i'm extremely pleased with it um and uh i just can't wait to to, to get out on it again yeah 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 same i've got i've got the ducati v4s um uh grand no rally the rally sat in the garage. I just took that to the Pyrenees. I took, oh, um, wow. I did a tour in the Pyrenees with Simon Weir and, and a group of lads uh, last week. Yeah. So I had the rally and Simon had, no, no, I had the grand tour and Simon had the rally, uh, the V4 oh, right. S's. So we, we sort of chopped and changed on them and rode them in. Oh, wow. You know, like that V4 engine. Oh my God, it was beautiful. But I tell yeah. you, it's it's not as quick as the 1300, but it it's way more engaging. It's just a more engaging engine. That you know, yeah. it, it it made me laugh and giggle. Whereas the 1300 does, but not to the same extent. And I'm I'm really hoping this this new exhaust does that. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll we'll be see. Interesting to see how you get over that. Definitely. Right, Charlie's got another question. He's got a question for both. You've got free range on what you're putting in it, but what would be your ultimate burger? Literally no limitations. Are you a burger man? Yes, yeah. yeah, sadly. And a curry man. Uh, curry burger. Um, I, would, I would say... What's that Japanese beef that everybody raves about? Uh, what's... Um... Was, 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 was it wasabi? No, it's not wasabi. 
What's no, it called? Wasabi is like a spice, I think. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah there, there's a particular type about. of beef from from Japan, yeah. uh, which my son-in-law's had. That's because I gave him the money to go and get one. Um, with a lot of strong chili infused cheese. For me, Ooh. that's that's the ultimate burger. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, what, baby. What, no, no bacon, onion rings. No, 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 no. I think I think bacon spoils it. That's only my opinion, and it's all subjective. We can't um, be friends. We can't be friends, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> bacon spoils nothing. There is nothing you can put bacon on that it doesn't make taste better. Nothing. Yeah. It's too too strong a taste, I think, with a burger. But that's only my my humble opinion. But that that would be that would be my my ultimate burger. That that Japanese meat, and I can't remember what the name is. Please oh, forgive me on that. Uh, and some strong chili cheese. Perfect. Gotcha. I would go Aberdeen Angus. Or some sort of Argentinian meat because I had an Argentinian yeah. steak once in in Prague and it was absolutely sensational. It was, was it? incredible this this steak. But yeah, um, and then I would have yeah some sort of stinky cheese. I do like a stinky cheese. Yeah, I'd have some sort yeah. of good strong cheese on it. I'd have to have bacon. I would even yeah, put some of that seemingly. green stuff on it. Yeah, I put a little bit of token, you know, the token green stuff. Have to have <laughs> onion rings. Oh, what else could you have with it? Tomato. Yeah, I'd chuck everything at it. Charlie, I'm yeah. I'm throwing everything at this. Yeah. Everything you yeah, can think the, the of. The problem comes when it, when it's that stacked high, we'll is deal actually with holding that. it. Or do you just like stick your head in it? I mean, <laughs> I have this, so whatever yeah, I yeah. eat, it gets untidy. So, you know. Just, just well, go for fully, it. Just fully, go. you should mention that um, one of my favourite foods, and it's disgusting, is hot Bombay mix. Oh, uh, hot Bombay mix. Yeah, hot Bombay mix. And this, I, I won't get too graphic, um, but I'll get graphic enough. Um, there's a wonderful shop in town, and they uh, they, they serve uh, the, the Muslim catering restaurants in the area, mm. and the, the lovely people get on well with them. Um, and they, they sell this this under the counter hot Bombay mix, and they sell it to me because they've embraced me over the years, and I've always been respectful. Um, and they're, they're really really nice. But this Bombay mix, mate, it's 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 like it's like my sidecar in a bag. It's disgusting. It's it's really disgusting. But I love it a bit. So one of the things I do on a Friday night. Is that, and I don't bother anybody. I just sit in a quiet, dark corner, and I get hammered, and I eat hot under the counter Bombay mix. Now, after a while, I'm that drunk that I'm just kind of throwing it at me, and whatever goes in my mouth is a bit of a bonus. <laughs> now, a lot of it, actually, I haven't got a beard, but what I have got is quite a bit of chest hair. So I store mine in my chest hair. <laughs> The rather than my beard. <laughs> but then it comes out everywhere, everywhere, and uh, um, she who must be obeyed gets gets somewhat irritated about it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. She comes in for a cuddle and <laughs> gets some madras. <laughs> oh. oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, nice one. Uh, Charlie says, keep them shiny side up, fellas. Thank you, Charlie, and you, Paul. Next one, David McCracken. Hello, both. Cymark looks like a very interesting company. I see that you're offering a ground anchor. Any plans to grow this element of the business and compete with the big brands, maybe attaining sold secure accreditation eventually? Uh, offering what? Sorry, I didn't get that first bit. The ground anchor. Oh, yeah, the beast. Yeah. Have you seen that? I have. I had a look. I saw yeah. his question. Now, if, you, if, you, if you look in the Oxford... English dictionary under over engineered, you'll see a photograph of the yeah, you'll see a photograph of the beast. There's a few about two or three foot away from me, actually. Um yeah, I guess I could do on that. And I guess um I would get a lot of um support from and only fair support. Um, if I if I went down the social media route and got people 
like yourself who 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 attack things like this to try and defeat them and quite rightly so because we all want the best product to look after our bikes um the only reason mine is so good by the way um is that because it's over engineered that much it's that thick that there's uh no no cutter will be able to get through it mm. because it's the, the thickness exceeds the diameter of the cutting wheel uh whereas you get ground anchors which are steel and the diameter of your finger and you can cut through yeah. them mm -hmm. with these bloody uh battery powered uh, uh angle grinders so um yeah um accreditation would be a good idea further down the line. um whether or not i would want to to do that i i don't know um i know it's okay if somebody sees that it's got some sort of accreditation i guess it would give them more peace of mind which i would support but intrinsically it's it's a very 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 safe or, or over engineered right. product because of the, the thickness that it is i mean i think it costs i think i nearly got to ship it on a pallet when somebody orders it um and uh you know it's not it's not far off a two-man lift this thing Jeez, really like, honestly it, it's it's mental it's <laughs> it's mental in fact on the grab so it's one, like an anvil just give me, would you just give me 10 seconds on the yeah, grab one and drop it on the desk and you will feel this where you're sat <laughs> bear with us folks it's coming right sorry about that this uh, Bloody this is the hell. beast. Good God, look at the thickness of it. Yeah, I know. I know. Is that it's should that mental. not be down the docks with a big boat yeah, attached yeah, yeah. to it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You could you could lasso a cruise ship to it. It is <laughs> it is mental. It probably costs a lot more to make than what I actually charge for it. But once again, I refer you to I'm not the sharpest pencil in the pack, and I do it because it's good. So so how is that that's, how is that attached to the ground? How do you attach that to the it's ground? It's attached by really, really thick uh have I got any security bolts. You basically you drill a hole a hundred millimeters down into solid concrete. Yeah, you hammer this thing in and then you tighten it up. And where you tighten it up at a certain torque, it snaps off and leaves a rounded dome that oh. you can't get any purchase on yeah 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 and that's that's how it that's how it attaches uh to the to the ground but i i've never and i guess i'd say this but i've never ever ever seen anything as as mental as this a dumbbell as, as far Jesus. as ground anchors go anywhere <laughs> uh it weighs an absolute ton and it costs a fortune to ship as well. But yeah, I, could, I, I think could, I've seen a flaw in your could, business model here, Mark. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's that's that's the ground anchor. Yeah, and I, I think it would it would outperform quite a lot on the market. Actually, be interesting, wouldn't it, I to see it, how it compares with with some of the um, market leaders, shall we say? Yeah, the accreditation yeah. thing that was brought up. I I am. Um, I had a chat from uh, Lightlock on, and um, that was a, a, something that was brought up by somebody. They were saying when they were looking on their insurance, the the Lightlock products weren't showing up as you know as like viable options on the insurance thing. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was saying that it, it, the insurance databases actually take forever to update. And I, I found that when I was trying to insure my thirteen hundred, because I got I yeah. got one of the first ones in the country back in October, and yeah, like, me too. It just it wasn't on the database. It didn't appear on the database. I think until either the end of twenty three, if not twenty four. So yeah, you know, it was, yeah, it was a I, pain I in the bum, a, wasn't it, to some, get it insured? Some some catchy up time. Yeah, uh, and I I really do like my light lock three because it, it mostly defeats angle angle grinders but the, the problem i've got there is is distraction and once again low iq because and i'll admit this in an open forum um i'm afraid i've 
forgotten that it's been fitted to the front wheel, and then I've tried to ride off with it. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I did it. I, I had a particular own, owner of stay at work. It is, I felt as if I'd been punched in the face all day. And I thought, great, I'm going to go home now. I, I might have some medicine uh, and everything will be okay. And uh, I went out to the bike full of gusto uh, and, and angst and, and everything else. I got on the bike and I tried to ride off. And, of course, it, it just hit the deck so hard that it set off that emergency call thing. Yeah. Um, and and, and I, I, I regressed for about five minutes. I couldn't speak. I tried to kill myself. Um, uh, thankfully, there was nobody around. Um, and after a while, all I could hear was this voice in the background saying, sir, are you okay? You've triggered yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. the collision, whatever it is. Uh, and I had to apologize. I said, look, I'm ever so sorry for my bad language. Wow, was it bad. <laughs> wow, was it bad? Twelve years of military service in a number of sentences. Uh, it was really bad. So I apologized profusely and I said, I'm ever so sorry. I've left my D shackle lock on. It's thrown me off. It's thrown the bike to the ground. Uh, and I, I was just trying to kill myself. So um yeah, it's it's a uh, I'm trying to remember to check now uh before i do anything but uh, uh i do think it's a cracking lock and i've got loads of lock and that's a good lock by the way um is uh it's not a plug it's just a really good idea um oxford do a really horrible cheap lock that you could you could bite in half with your teeth it's called an oxford junior i think but if you fit it in between the fork stanchion I'll send you a photograph sometime mm -hmm. in between the fork stanchion and the brake caliper, such as the positioning of it that you can't actually get it to it with an angle grinder mm. uh, because the angle grinder would encroach on the fork stanchion first and the brake caliper. And it's a cracking bit of kit. It costs something like £26. Wow. Um, it's, it's, it's very small. There's hardly anything to it. And if you fit it to your disc, in between the fork stanchion and the caliper, and I've tried this myself, you can't actually get an angle grinder into it to cut it off. Wow, I'd never heard of that one. I'll have a look at that. Yeah, mm. re really, really, really good bit of kit. Uh, I tell everybody about it because it's cheap uh, and it's very, very effective, um, and uh, it's it's a lot cheaper than the, the Light Lock 3. Not that I'm locking mm. that. I think it's a brilliant lock. Yeah, I, I bought the light lock after after I had them on the podcast. I bought the X3 actually. I had an X. I've got an X1 and the the core. Yeah. Um, but I, I bought the X3 as well just to be doubly secure. Well, triply secure. Yeah. I got that. Yeah. But um, interesting what you said about riding off with it still on. Somebody, one of my mates, just did that actually last week. Did exactly that. He had the X3 on his thirteen hundred GS. And uh, yeah, ooh, didn't end well. I won't go into any details to save his embarrassment, but it didn't end well. <laughs> anyway, yeah. David's got a second question. Have there been any standout or unique custom parts that have really been difficult to manufacture, or that you have, or that have involved collaboration with other companies? Um, well, that's the second bit first because it's the easiest answer. Um, th there's. There's been little or no collaboration with any of the companies, and that's for good reason, uh, because everything within the hallowed hallowed walls of Cymark I can control, yeah, uh, or Mick can control. So um, it's very rare that I ever put anything out because then I'm I'm relying on on other people who might not have the same philosophy as me when it comes to. To, to make in the parts there yeah. is an exception um and that's uh, uh a lovely little company on the other side of town uh owned by a polish guy called uh mick ariani uh who i've known for about 30 years and he he does machining and he's the only person i trust uh and and let do the the machining side of life for for some of the parts that i produce that do need machining so no, I don't tend to do collaborations because of that that reason. Mm -hmm. um, and what was the first question? Uh, have there been any standout or unique custom parts that have been really difficult to manufacture? 
Um, yeah, the armadillo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that was really, 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 really difficult. Uh, no, not really. Um, uh, we we get the we all work to, to tolerances within engineering. Uh, and general tolerances tend to be absolutely fine. A laser, for instance, will will cut to 0.2 of a millimetre accuracy, and that's over a three-metre distance. Mm. So um, naturally, our, our gear tends to be very precise and to a tight tolerance. Further down the line with the CNC forming and the welding, that's, that's when things can become quite difficult and actually actually i'm very pleased to say that um the um uh the, the tolerance is um uh politely requested by by hex on the brackets that i do for them uh have been so tight um wonderfully because it's good i like it you like a challenge uh, and it's a breath of fresh air um that that's been challenging because i've had to write a lot of QA procedures that I wouldn't normally do. Um, I'm not slack by by any means. Uh, however, if I make something um, and it's right, fantastic, uh, because 99.9% .9 of the time, it'll be fine. Mm. Um, hex demand, and I support this, 100% right. Uh, so that's been a bit challenging because I wouldn't normally go for that 0.1% mm. on on absolute quality. But it's for Hex. I want to do my best for them, uh, and I do support it. An example of that, here we go. Um, uh, hopefully this isn't a, a, a spoiler, uh, but one of, the, one of the brackets I'm actually working on for, for Stephen is this. Mm -hmm. It's off of the R... 1300 um and it's the type 3 bracket and it will be out in circulation in due course when hex decide it is going to be and uh it's a um an auxiliary rear light bracket for the Ooh. 1300 and um it's absolutely fit for purpose no problems with it at all i've tried it on my bike it's great uh but Hex being as wonderful as they are, and I don't just mean Stephen, um, we, we are now looking at changing the angle. Can you see, if I get yeah. it on profile, can you see the mm -hmm. angle there? Mm -hmm. uh, changing the angle by just a few degrees. Now, the thing is, Bruce, you can't see this. <laughs> you, you know, I can measure it. Your average guy in the street can't measure it. Yeah. Uh, but... It's 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 wonderfully what they want, uh, and it's 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 great. So um, it's lovely to be to be uh, uh, stretched by hex, uh, and that never sounds good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it's 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 difficult, but it's it's good as well because. Uh, the, the company have got obviously high standards, which I yeah. utterly support, uh, and I massively think are, are, are brilliant. And it's good for me, rather than me impose my tolerances on anybody else. I yeah, that that's good enough, and my stuff has been good enough for a long time now. To have a customer say to me, "No, we we want it at this yeah. precise angle, or we want it to this precise measurement," it's great. It's great. I I, I love it. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, you're being challenged, aren't you? You, you? Even after 30, 40 years in the in the industry, you're being challenged. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. I really do like it. Hopefully that answers that question. He's got a third question. Finally, all the cool kids like me have Honda monkey bikes. If I wanted a custom part, for example, a stainless steel bash plate, how would you go about designing and making one for me? Well, I already make a custom designed bash plate for the Suzuki van van which is very similar to the to the monkey bike um the way i would if it was a bmw the way i would go about it is by going out and buying the bike mm -hmm. and then 
designing the play for it. It's not a very cost-effective way of doing it. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> I must admit, um, that's why I hope my bank manager never, ever views your wonderful <laughs> podcast. Um, so if it was a BMW, I'd go out and buy the bike, and I would design it and make sure that it fitted perfectly. Uh, but because it's not a BMW, the way I'd go about it is I'd, I'd invite the customer to the factory, mm-hmm. uh, and I would take some initial drawings, and I'd make a few prototypes, and I'd evolve those prototypes to the point where the part was perfect or uh, to a standard that I'd be happy to have on my bike, regardless mm-hmm. of cost. I wouldn't charge for the R&D because I don't do that. I'd just charge for the part itself. Of, and that's how I would go about making a bash plate for a monkey bike. Wow. Do you ever utilize these 3D scanners? I see a lot of companies when the 1300 was coming out uh, and, you know, things like the mud sling, the fender extender, just all the usual accessories that you'd buy for the 1200 and the 1250 you want for the 1300. A lot of companies were like, oh, yeah, we're, we're a way to go and do the scan. And they just had like these hand scanners, 3D hand scanners. God knows how much they cost. But that's what they were doing. They would hand scan a bike in a, de- in a dealership somewhere and build the model. And then they designed off the model. Do you ever, would you ever utilize that sort of technology, do you think? Uh, I don't know. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, low IQ, not necessarily cost. <laughs> Uh, being be, be, be understanding how it works, uh, but I'm aware of them. And I've seen them, um, and I guess this is a is a is a dinosaur answer, but I do actually mean it. Um, a lot is done on CAD. A lot is done on on the uh, uh, on the computer screen nowadays, but when we do that, we get things like the 1300 which is full of faults and problems mm. because it was designed on a computer screen. There's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that, but look what it's done for us. Now, I think it's brilliant. I haven't got one of these scanners myself, and I have not I have thought about doing one. But at the moment, I, I will visualise a product, I'll make it in cardboard, then I'll make it in steel, and I'll keep on making it. Now, there is an advantage to that over doing it on a screen, and that's because you can actually feel it. Yeah, It's tangible, yeah. uh, and it's something which Stephen very kindly allows me to do for him. Um, he'll he'll come up with a design which he would like, and I'll, uh, of course, I've got to draw it within CAD, um, but that's where it stops. I'll actually make the item, and I'll send it down to him mm-hmm. so we can touchy-feely it. Because yeah. I think with a lot of this scan stuff, you can produce an item that you've never actually touched or felt or felt the weight of it or even put it against the bike. And I think that we miss something there between computer-aided design, as brilliant as it is, and I'm not knocking it, and having a tangible item going through that evolution stage where you can feel it and see it and touch it rather than producing something off of a computer screen because look how that worked out for us on the 1300. Mm-hmm. So a um, yeah. bit of a long-winded Simon Bates answer there. Yes, I think the scanners are great, but they are not, they are not a comprehensive solution. I think it also should be married up with actually making the stuff but of course making a prototype is a lot more expensive than doing it on a screen yeah, I of course that. of course uh, and, and also obviously utilizing the 3d scanner technology that that can allow you to get that first say you haven't physically got access to that to that bike to measure whatever it is that you need to create yeah. the, the, the initial prototype component part you can use the 3d scanner to do that can't you and then physically you know mock up that part and then you've then now you've got it in your hands and you can then fit that to if you can get access to the bike fit that to the bike see what you need to alter yeah yeah i I get what you're saying though you know the traditional tangible um 
yeah. feeling. Yeah. It's, the, it's the also a very cost-effective way of doing things. Mm. It's quite expensive to go out and buy the bike. Yes. Uh, but don't tell the missus. Um, uh, but these scanners aren't cheap either, are they? No, 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 the bikes aren't cheap either. I think it'll be cheaper to buy a scanner. But then again, uh, if I buy the bike, then I know I can be sure about it. And uh, well, I might have to ride it as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, no, there's, there's, there's an additional benefit to it. That's it. <laughs> Nice one. Cheers, David, for that question. Next one, uh, Owen Harries. Hi, both. Quick question for both. What would you say were, or still are, from your youth or as you went through the decades, are your three favourite music artists or bands? Some you may have seen live, others you may have, uh, or others maybe through the medium of radio, tape, cassette, CD, or via the internet. You only have three. Ooh. Right. First one is Flock of Seagulls, if you remember those. Really? Yeah. Okay. Flock, yeah, of, yeah. flock of seagulls. Did you have the hair? Uh, just, just... Did you have the, the crazy hair? <laughs> no, no, I've never had the hair, actually. <laughs> uh, apart from on my chest, but it's for the hot Bombay mix. Uh, <laughs> flock of seagulls, because it brings back so many memories of time when I had my um, Honda 250 Dream and my mate had his Yamaha XS400. Um, shortly after that, uh, Def Leppard, which is a a localish to me group, a Sheffield yeah. group. Yeah. Um they 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 had a one armed drummer. That's right, which, I remember him. Yeah, that's right, which which just blows me away every time I say it. Uh if if I ever think I'm I, I have tenacity, uh then I just think about that guy and realize that I'm just a pussy. Um and the third one I think everybody's favourite, and I wish I would have seen them in the uh, River Plate, and that's ACDC. Oh, wow. So that would be my my third, uh, my three groups. And, in fact, uh, even now on a, on a night time, not tonight, obviously, or a weekend when I'm when I'm making stuff, um, I've got a PA system in the factory. I tend to put ACDC on that loud that my ears bleed, but I was in the artillery, uh, and, and it's fantastic. Have you never yeah. seen them live, ACDC? No. you kidding. Every time I've gone to, I've been too late, and I, I would have eaten my own spleen to go and see them at the uh, River Plate. The times I've watched the video uh, on YouTube, I can't – I've lost count because it's so brilliant. Oh, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen them with my – my missus is right into them and Def Leppard and all that. Yeah. So I've seen them with my wife, and she's – Wow. She's away, she's away next week, I think. I think they're playing at the O2 or Wembley or somewhere. She's away next week to go and see them anyway. I know that with her brother. Really? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I thought they stopped touring. No, God, no. They're all still going. ACDC is still going. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, who, who would be mine then? Three, you know, I'm a big fan of the Foo Fighters. I love the Foo Fighters. Uh, believe it or not, I've I've got right into Credence Clearwater Revival. No idea why. <laughs> Don't know where it came from. I know where it came from. I did a I did a tour to the states in March, and I was in Appalachia. You know, up in the mountains, all like Virginia, yeah. West Virginia. Tennessee, North Carolina, and I was riding along, and I had my cardo on, and I was just playing like a country, country playlist off Spotify. Other yeah. music services are available, obviously, and it was yeah. pumping out like Credence Clearwater uh, Survival, just all the big country lot, and yeah, I was having a, I was having a whale of a time. It's Clearance, yeah, Credence is country, isn't it? But they played anyway because I was like, oh, who's that? And I had a look. All oh, right. And that got me right into Credence Clearwater Revival. Who else? Wow. Who else? I've sort of found, I've sort of found the Rolling Stones at a late point in life. Like I'm, I'm in my late forties okay. now, yeah. and I, I wasn't really into them before, but I quite like them now. Quite getting into all that. Yeah, uh, yeah never, I'll go with never that. Really, never Not really appealed to me. Nor, nor is the Beatles. I just can't really yeah. get into to no, some I music. Some music does it for you. Some music doesn't. It's um, also time for me. It's getting the time uh, to, to listen to stuff. Uh, it is therapeutic. Not as therapeutic as that, I must admit. Uh, it takes some beating. But, um, 
um yeah music's music's good music's good yeah yeah i i, I always used to have music going all the time like sheesh if i was doing anything studying at school i had music playing any job that i'd had before before joining your bill I always had music playing I kind of, I, I don't really, the only time I have it on now is when I'm on the bike. That's about the only time I get to listen. Or like out yeah. walking a dog, yeah, that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Apart from working at night or weekends, yeah. I tend to put it on. But um, I, I'm not that skilled enough. Uh, I put a lot of friends who, who are, but they used to do pursuits with noise in their ears and all the rest of it. Um. I'm not that skilled where I, I can have the music on when I'm doing what they call a spirited ride um, mm. uh, because it's too much of a distraction for me. Uh, mm. But other than that, if I'm just tootling along, then then yeah. And the Cardo products, that there are other products available, uh, are, 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 are great for that. Are great yeah, for absolutely. that, of course. Uh, right, mate, we've got two questions left. Are you okay for time? I know I've kept you here for coming on two, over two hours. You're right for time. Bang. Hasn't that gone? <laughs> it does. It's it's crazy how quick it goes. Uh, Louise Warsfold. Evening both. How you doing, Lou? Uh, I love the podcast, but can never really think of a question beforehand, but then could think of loads whilst listening. Anyone else have that issue? My question this time to Mark. With 30 years riding experience and no doubt lots of tours under your belt, what's the most embarrassing situation that your bike has caused you to be in? Um, well, firstly, it's it's actually close to 50 years. Um, and I think the most embarrassing. Oh, crikey, there's that many. Um, I think the most embarrassing was a long time ago when I was a kid. Uh, and I'm not, not particularly proud of this. Um, but um, um, I was based at uh, the barracks just outside Curtin Lindsay, which is a, uh, a barracks uh, not far from here during my uh, early military career. And it was when I was even more stupid than what I am now. And at the time, I had a, a Kawasaki GPZ 1100. I've got one now, actually, um, sat alongside my Suzuki X7. And... Uh, uh, I'm too old to ride it now, but back in the day, I used to ride it. Now, the thing, the embarrassing thing was that the village, Kurt Lindsay, was literally a stone's throw to where the barracks was. The barracks sat on the outside of the village. Yeah. And, and for reasons best left to, to other people, I decided to ride my 1100 down into the village and then drink too much and once again uh, i'm not proud of this and i was young and i was very stupid I've, I've never done it since um and i decided to ride my bike back to the barracks i mm. could have left it there and walked back it was a a distance of i don't know less than three miles and as i approached approached the barracks the barracks sat uh uh on on a wide junction yeah so um i got to the junction i could either turn left to go to the main gate or turn right to follow the perimeter around the uh, uh, the barracks. But for some reason, stupidity mostly, I went straight on and I rode the bike up over the curb, across the grass and into the perimeter fence around the barracks. And that was the most embarrassing time for me on a bike because, and I deserved everything I got, and quite rightly, everybody heard that Mark Uden had ridden his bike into the side of the barracks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because he's an idiot. <laughs> uh, and it went through, it went through the re regiment like wildfire. Um, and uh it, it was it was so embarrassing for me that it took me, I don't know, months, maybe, maybe years to get over. And that was the most embarrassing time on a bike. And quite rightly so. What impact did that have on you then? What like what not what lesson did you learn? Did that have an impact on you? Because for me, like, if I've had accidents on the bike, whether they're my fault or not, like it, it, I, 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 I feel embarrassed if I have an accident on the bike purely because 
you know, I, I have a presence on social media and people expect you to like almost be not infallible, but you know what I mean? It's just like a fucking yeah. idiot. What have you done that for? Kind of thing. So it, it, it made, it makes me, oh, I sort of analyze it and go, right. What did I do wrong there? What could I have done better? Yeah. All right. What training do I need to do now? Like what, what can I do to stop that happening again? What, what, what sort of impact did that have on you at the time then? I, I think at the very young age, it had, a, it had a massive impact on me because I can still remember it now and I can't remember what I had for tea last night and I probably cooked it. <laughs> Excuse me. And I think it was because it went through the regiment like wildfire Aye. because it was a big happening. Yeah. Uh, Mark had ridden his bike into the barracks uh, when he could have turned left or right. And and it was the, the embarrassment... And there was only something else which, which, uh, <laughs> which similar to that, which I'll recount because it is amusing. Um, it was, it was the embarrassment that everybody knew in the whole regiment that that really had. And I'm pleased that it did. It had a massive impact on me, uh, and because of that, uh, I've I've never, ever, ever uh, done that uh, uh, again. Uh, in fact, I'll be walking home tonight uh, mm. because I've had a drink even on the, uh, I won't even ride a sidecar. Uh, it had that much of an impact that has resonated throughout the decades with me. Mm. And now I, I do wonder if I wouldn't have been so embarrassed, would I have continued to do very mm. dangerous practices like that? I'd like to think that I, w I wouldn't, but certainly because of the embarrassment, it had a really big impact on me, um, and uh, I've 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 never I've never ever done it since. But on on the same sort of level and more entertaining, um, uh, something else happened at the barracks. The the regimental sergeant major recently had the parade square resurfaced, and a parade square to an RSM is 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 is, is it's sacred ground basically. Yeah, it's the holy land. And we had. <laughs> Excuse me. We had a um, a rapier day. That's where we get all our rapier launchers out, and we invite all the local civilians to see what we do, and yep. it's great and fantastic. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, I was charged with taking some white paint back to the stores on the back of a four-ton Bedford mm -hmm. truck. Yeah, yeah. You probably know where, I this can is see going. where this is going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I jumped in the truck uh, with with my my mucker Gilly at the time, and I said, "Right, let, let's get these back to the store." And he said, "Yeah, why don't we go to the naffy and get a pie? It's only on the other side of the parade square." So I said, "Brilliant idea!" And I got to the parade square and I bumped up the curb, uh, and I drove across. The, yeah, you know, uh, I drove across the parade square and stopped at the naffy. Uh, and he got out and I got out and I looked at what had happened and I wanted to die. I wanted to kill myself because <laughs> what had happened was when I bumped up over the curb, yeah. a tin of white paint had tipped off <laughs> on the back of the Bedford and it had left a trail of gloss paint across the parade square. It's a true story, oh, this. Oh, my God. Across the parade square. Uh, my mucker Gilly started to, to whimper like a girl because he realised what this meant. Uh, I started to whimper like a girl because I knew what it meant. So um, I I went straight down to the RSM's office. I knocked on the door and he said, oh, Bomber de Hooten, how are you? I said, oh, I'm fine, actually, sir, but I need to tell you. Oh, no. Oh, you're, you're, selling. Back. <laughs> you're, you're, you're froze and, uh, there. You're uh, back. Right. Oh, uh, I said, sir, you're not going to believe this, but I've I've taken the Bedford across your new parade square and it had a tin of paint on the back which tipped over and it's left a trail of gloss white paint across your parade square. And he said, oh, Bomber de Hooten, you are a bit of a character, you know. Oh, yeah, I've come to know that of you. That's very funny. And I said, no, no, sir, I've actually done this. Um, uh, do you want to kill me now? And he said, right, you've got a few hours to sort that out. And, he, and, and off I went. And I went to the stores and I bought a load of, I didn't buy it, I got a load of thinners yeah. and a bass broom. And I tried to scrub it. 
But what I, what I did was I, I took a, a white stripe about that wide and, and I made it a grey one about that wide. <laughs> uh, so I only made it worse. And, and word got round the regiment along the lines of, guess what? Mark Hooten hasn't only ridden his bike into the barracks, <laughs> but he's also put a stripe across the regimental parade square that the RSM has just got oh, redone. Brilliant. Brilliant. And, and people from all the regiment came out to see me scrubbing this line across the parade square. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 That, that was, I can look back on that now with humor. That was embarrassing. I can look back on that time on my motorbike with no humor whatsoever. And that was embarrassing and quite rightly so. So that's the answer to that question. You can't leave us there, Mark. What what happened to the paint? Did you get it sorted? Well, well, that actually, it's still there to this day. It's still there to this day. It's just <laughs> faded. It's just faded. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, be, it became known as Hoot and Stripe, really. Uh, what did you get for that? The, the only way you could really get it out would be by relaying yeah. the, the, the parade square, which obviously was nonsensical. Yeah, I do stuff like that. Yeah. Did you did you get a yeah. stern word for that or um uh well well <laughs> I remember I remember when I was scrubbing with the bass broom, the RSM walking up from RHQ up to the up to the warrant officer's <laughs> mess uh with his pace stick. And I do actually think that because we, we were all really sort of we we had various traits back then i th actually think that he was in denial because if you think about it how can you possibly consider that somebody and it's going to be bomber hooten if it's going to be anybody that somebody is going to leave a stripe of white gloss paint across your <laughs> parade square shortly after you've had it resurfaced <laughs> i think i would be in denial too so nothing ever came of that punishment wise wow. um i think the rsm moved on in due course to another posting Had a heart uh, attack. but but yeah but of course it was it was there and it's there to this day actually it's a lot more faded but you can still see it that's brilliant brilliant yeah uh right Jeez. just for that one Lou. last one yes. baron bemrose Cymark are local to me. I applaud them for manufacturing at home. How hard is it to compete with the AliExpress, Amazons, etc., and people's mindset? It's the same thing made in the same factory. All the brands are at it. Possibly contemplate the question while viewing the Chinese-owned British steel plant. Right. We sort of touched on this earlier. So uh, how hard is it to compete with your competitors? Not at all. Uh, we did touch on this earlier on. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I find it, uh, I don't even think about competing with my competitors, AliExpress, uh, because we service different markets. Mm -hmm. I service a market where people gravitate to um, stuff made by one person who is sober most of the time, who they can talk to, uh, and it's over-engineered. So um, it, it's wonderful. Uh, we've also had two questions tonight. It's wonderful because I don't have to worry about competing with AliExpress. Yeah. I get worried about AliExpress because there's huggers out there which uh, rely on very cheap Chinese steel bolts, mm -hmm. which have sheared off in the past and have caused people to have offs. Um, so I, I I see that there's a place in the market for them because people want cheap crap. Um, um, and and that's fantastic. But if you buy that sort of stuff for a critical part like a hugger or a brake linkage or something like that, then you really are taking your 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 life into your own hands and yeah. i won't compete with that i will i refuse to compete with aliexpress not only will that put me out of business even quicker than what i can do it but it's just a race to the bottom it really really is so no it's not a fear of mine uh and i won't even try and compete because i can't and i don't want to 
Yeah, and you're a different, as you said, you're a different market, aren't you? You are a you are a yeah, different market, yeah. a quality and, product. And the the observer is quite correct. Our, our still works are under Chinese ownership at the moment, mm. Mm. and they've been under Indian ownership, Dutch ownership, and anybody else who wants to come along and buy it. Um, and I personally um, seems if I'm getting on my soapbox here, I don't necessarily think it's a it's a good thing because our manufacturing is being governed by uh, an offshore entity, China, which have a different philosophy to us. Yep. Um, generally speaking, not everywhere, but generally speaking, um, and and I I don't I don't think that's a that's a good thing. But that's my only my personal view. I agree with you on that. Absolutely. Mm. Um, Mark, I think that is a, a good place to to end the chat. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you, mate. Um, Fantastic. Before before we go, I normally open the floor up to you for a chance. You know, you can say your hellos or you can plug a company, plug a product, plug your socials, your website, whatever you want. The floor is yours. Over to you. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm purposely not going to plug Simart by Parts. Um uh, because uh, I uh, I think that uh, um, it should stand on its reputation, mm -hmm. uh, but I would certainly plug uh, the Bucklew Arms up at Moffitt. Um, they're a wonderful they're a wonderful crowd. I absolutely love them to bits. I really do. I'm so close to those guys, uh, and they mean so much to me. Um, I will plug everybody who works for me. I would certainly plug Catherine who runs the place for me. Uh, because she does such a good job, uh, and I think so much of her. Um, and I would plug every single small to medium-sized enterprise in this country that make their own stuff. Um, and, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, and I guess, of course, I would plug Hex. <laughs> Mega. Um, well, I'll do the plug-in for you then, pal. Folks, if you want to find out ah. more about Cymark and Cymark Bike Parts, check the links down below. The website will be on there and the social media, that will all be there. So make sure you give them a like, a follow, subscribe, all the rest of it. Uh, Mark, uh, I, I personally think you've come across fantastically well in this chat. I love the fact that you take such pride in what you do and and being i love the fact that you're a british company british manufacturing um producing products uh top quality products here in the uk for the biking market i love it um you need to shout a lot more about that and i'll be shouting about that as well for sure um well, sorry go on apologies I interrupted. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's very kind of you i've thoroughly enjoyed the experience uh, I'm no longer a podcast virgin. You've been very gentle with me. Thank you very much. Uh, I do look forward to the day where I can shake your hand um, uh, and, and have a drink with you. Uh, that'll be a pleasure deferred, but I look forward to it. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your support of British manufacturing. Pleasure. Pleasure. I'll take you up on that drink. We'll do it Great. in person. Fantastic. Awesome. Right, folks, hope you've enjoyed this one. Make sure you give Simark uh, a little uh, support there. Keep doing your thing. Get on out there whenever you can. Look after those that you love. But most importantly, most importantly, live your life. Right, where's that stop button?